story one of the human boy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the human boy by eden philpotts story one the artfulness of steggles one i remember the very evening he came to maryville nubby tompkins had a cold on his chest so mathers and i stopped in from the half-hour kickabout in the playground before tea being chums of nubby's whenever he gets a cold on the chest he thinks he's going to die and this evening sitting by the fire in the fifth classroom he roasted chestnuts for mathers and me and took a very gloomy view of his future life as you know he said i hate being out of doors excepting when i can lie about in hay and to make me go out walking in all weathers as they do here is simply murder i know what'll be the end of it i shall get bacilluses or microbes into some important part of me and die it's like those books the doctor reads to the kids on sundays with choir boys in them the little brutes sing like angels and their voices go echoing to the top of cathedrals and make people blub about in the pews then they get microbes on the chest and kick you know the only thing i can do is to sing and i shall die as sure as mud nubby was a corker at singing he had all the solos in the chapel to himself and people came miles to hear him you won't die said mathers you don't give your money away to the poor or help blind people across roads and all that your voice'll crack and you'll live oh i wish it would said nobby i would feel a lot safer mine continued mathers cracked when my mustache came we looked at him as he patted it mathers was going next term he had more moustache than at least two of the undermasters and once he let nubby stroke it and nubby said he could feel it distinctly under the hand that's what's done it with him said nubby looking at mathers and opening another gloomy subject mathers got redder and began peeling a chestnut i wish i was as certain as you he said none of us can be certain i said but if your voice did go nubs you'd be out of the hunt for one i am declared nubby last time i had a cold in the throat she sent me a little bunch of grapes by jane and a packet of black currant lozenges but this time though the attack is on my chest and i may die she hasn't sent a thing well perhaps she doesn't know she does i met her going into the library yesterday and i doubled up and barked like a dog and she never even said she was sorry it lies between you two chaps now i believe you are going strongest just at present said mathers critically to me you came off last wednesday and kicked two goals on your own and she said afterwards to brown that she never saw you play a bigger game then that little beast brown i mean sniggered and made that noise in his throat like a sprung bat and said he was quite glad he hadn't kept you in that's how he shows em of what a gulf there is between the fifth and masters the bigger the gulf the better i said it would be rough on a decent worm to put it second to brown in my opinion even a double first would be nothing if he wore salmon-coloured ties and elastic-sided boots and brown isn't a double first by long chalks he can only teach the kids and his desk is well known to be crammed with cribs of every kind in the matter of m i may say at once that she was milly dr denham's youngest daughter twelve and a half fair blue eyes and jolly difficult to please somehow the fifth always drew her most the six were feeble beggars at that time two of the ten wore spectacles and one was going out to africa as a missionary and used to treat the fifth's classroom as a sort of training ground for preaching and doing good he was called fulcher and the spirit was willing in him but the flesh was flabby we used to assegai him with stumps and pretend to scalp him and boil him and eat him he said he should glory in martyrdom really and nubs who knows a good deal about eating used to write recipes for cooking fulcher and post them to imaginary african kings but i should think that to be merely eaten is not martyrdom properly speaking 
if it is then everything we eat down to periwinkles must be martyrs which is absurd like euclid says well it got to be a settled idea at merivale that m cared in a sort of vague way for either nubby or mathers or me or all of us the situation was too uncertain for anything like real jealousy among us besides we were chums and had no objection to going shares in m s regard at football mathers and i fought like demons for merivale and for m s good word but any impression we might make was generally swept away in chapel by nubby when sunday came he could sing mind you it was like cold water down your spine and all from printed music besides he could be ill which gave him a pull over mathers and me who couldn't to look at nubby was nothing he had big limbs but they were soft as sausages if you punched him he didn't bruise yellow and afterwards black but merely turned red and then white again mathers besides being captain of the first footer eleven had nigger hair that girls always go dotty about and black eyes and pretty nearly as much moustache as eyebrow as for me my biceps were the biggest in the lower school which isn't much of course but things like that tell with a girl then it was that conversation turned to steggles he was a new boy due that afternoon hardly had the name passed my lips when the door opened and the doctor's head appeared the next moment a chap followed him ah there are some of the fellows by the fire said the doctor is that you tompkins but i needn't ask yes sir said nubby rising you are ill-advised tompkins to spend the greater part of your leisure sitting as you do almost upon the hob a constitutional weakness is thereby increased this is steggles you will have time for a little conversation before tea the doctor disappeared and steggles came slowly down the room with his hands in his pockets there was nothing to indicate a new boy about him he had red rims to his eyes and a spot or two on his face chiefly near his nose and on his forehead his hair was sandy and he wore a gold watch-chain you're called steggles aren't you said nubby who was an awfully civil chap in his manners i am well i hope you'll like merivale do you all right in summer time when there's hay hate it when i'm ill which i am now what can you do asked mathers in his abrupt way i can draw said steggles what devils do one said mathers he got a piece of cambridge demi and a pen and ink then steggles evidently anxious to please sat down and did as good a devil as ever i saw nubby and i were greatly pleased what else can you do said mathers as if such a power to draw devils wasn't as much as you could expect from one chap well, i can smoke cigarettes so can anybody no a pipe oh where did you learn that at harrow then steggles started like a guilty thing and put his hand over his mouth too late a rumour we had heard was proved true it would have been sure to get out and i don't care who knows it for that matter said steggles defiantly i had to leave there because i didn't know enough and couldn't get up higher in the school i'm rather backward through not being properly taught the teaching at harrow simply's cruel not but what i've taught myself a thing or two mind you i'm fifteen he looked at us out of his red-rimmed eyes and put me in mind of a ferret i've got at home he might have been any age up to twenty i thought can you play anything asked mathers well the piano mathers shivered and nubby grew excited uh, so can i we'll do duets he said uh, if you like said steggles then the tea-bell rang two whole books might be written about steggles at merivale i heard thompson say after he had been there a week that it wasn't what he didn't know had rendered it necessary for steggles to leave harrow but what he did know certainly he had a great deal of general information about rum things he got newspapers by post concerning sporting matters he knew an immense deal about dogs and horses and nubbs who was a judge said his piano playing surpassed his devil drawing for sheer brilliance yet with all these accomplishments he only managed to get into the fourth as to his smoking it was certainly wonderful and he ate things afterwards to hide the smell 
he had a genius for wriggling out of rows and for getting them up between other fellows he loved to look on at fighting and knew all the proper rules on the whole he was rather a beast and if it hadn't been for nubby mathers and i should have barred him but all i'm going to tell about now is the hideous discovery of steggles and m and the thing that happened on the day of the match with buckland grammar school m had been very queer for a fortnight queer i mean with all three of us which was unusual then seeing how the cat had taken to jumping i tackled her one morning going through the hall to the doctor's study how'd you like steggles i said oh, very well he's clever she said he's fifteen i said he ought to know something if he's ever going to he's only in the fourth anyway you're jealous and so is mathers she said jealous of a chap with ferret eyes not likely i said you are though not more than nubs and mathers anyway i said it's off with the old friends and on with the new i suppose steggles knows how to treat a girl you might learn manners from him and so might the others she said and also the piano perhaps he plays beautifully have you seen him play football no lucky for you football isn't everything no and not since he came i've noticed that this bitter speech stung em and her eyes jolly well flashed sparks nor singing either i went on nubs nearly burst himself last sunday in chapel and all the time you were watching steggles making a rabbit with his pocket handkerchief i'll thank you not to interest yourself in me any more she said either in chapel or out of it all right i dare say i shall still live i said does that remark apply equally to mathers and nubby or only to me to mathers yes she said he's as bad as you are not to nubs then she went well there it stood when i told them mathers seemed to think i needn't have dragged him in and nubs got clean above himself with hope not seeing that he was really just as much out of it as us of course we chucked steggles for good and all then and told him what we thought of him that was when he said something about only the brave deserving the fair and mathers made him sit down in a puddle for cheeking him in the playground steggles eyes looked like one of his own devils while he sat there but he took it jolly quietly at the time that got nubby's wool off though because he supported steggles and things were in fact rather difficult all round till the day of the buckland grammar school match buckland was two miles from maryvale and most of the team went by train but mathers and i the day being fine decided to walk and at the last moment nubs asked if he might come with steggles out of consideration for nubby we agreed and the four of us started on a fine bright afternoon just after dinner mathers and i had our football things on of course nubs was dressed in his usual style and steggles who used to get himself up tremendously on half holidays wore yellow spats over his boots and a sort of white thing under his waistcoat and gloves we had rather more than half an hour's walk before us and hardly were we out of sight of merivale when steggles pulled out his pipe and lighted it three the artfulness of steggles properly begins here he knew several things we didn't he knew for instance that m was coming to the football match that she was going to ride her bicycle over on the road by which we walked that only the day before he had quarrelled with her and that his position with regard to her was at that hour most risky all these things steggles well knew and we didn't so he lighted his pipe with an air of long practice the smell was fine and he smacked his lips now and then nice pouch he said handing me a velveteen pouch with his initials on it in green silk i'll bet a girl did that said mathers ah, it's a secret said steggles smiling to himself then he asked very civilly if we would care to join him explaining that he generally kept a few spare pipes about him for friends i would if it wasn't for the match said mathers so would i i said 
well my backy might turn you fellows up perhaps you are wise declared steggles puffing away then he tried nubby with a little cherry wood pipe and nubs thought a whiff or two wouldn't hurt him and began rather nervously but gathered courage as he went on i heard my father say once that life without tobacco would be hell said steggles and i agree with him so do i it's very soothing said nubby then mathers burst out he had been sulking ever since steggles hinted that the contents of his velveteen pouch were too strong for us if you think i funk your tobacco you're wrong mathers said i've smoked three parts of a cigar before to-day a chocolate one perhaps said steggles but in such a humble inquiring voice that mathers couldn't hit him no a tobacco one and if you've got another pipe i'll show you so will i i chimed in mathers lead was always good enough for me steggles immediately lugged out two more pipes he seemed to be stuffed with them get it well alight at the start he explained handing a fusee all right all right i know said mathers soon we were at it like four chimneys and steggles praised us in such a way that we could take no offence you've all smoked many a time and oft i can see that he said mathers spat about a good deal and fancied tobacco was probably a fine steadier for the nerves before a football match and nubbs said he thought so too and he also thought that after a little smoking one didn't want to talk but ought just to keep quiet and think of interesting things it widens the mind said steggles we tramped on rather silently for ten minutes till nubbs spoke again to our surprise his hopeful tone had changed and we found he had turned a sort of putty colour with blue lips he said i'll um overtake you fellows I, I think i've got i've got a bit of a sunstroke or something it, it'll pass off no doubt better not smoke any more said steggles oh it isn't that but i won't all the same i'll just dodge through that hole in the hedge and find some wild strawberries or hazelnuts or something seeing it was a frosty day in december nubby's statements looked wild but he went there was a hole in the hedge with tree roots trailing across it and nubs crawled shakily through like a wounded rabbit into a place where a board was stuck up saying that people would be prosecuted according to law if they went there but he didn't seem to care though it wasn't a thing he would have done in cold blood i saw mathers grow uneasy in his mind wasn't the pipe eh oh no no this tobacco why a child could smoke it said steggles you know what nubs is it's only an excuse to turn he hates football and hates walking we kept on again and i began to feel a slight perspiration on my forehead and a weird sort of feeling everywhere i had smoked about half the pipe i shan't go on with this now because of the match i said hastily knocking out the remaining tobacco and handing his loathsome little clay back to steggles why he said blessed if you haven't gone the same colour as nubs did don't say you've got a sunstroke too there was something in the voice of steggles i didn't much like but i hardly felt equal to answering him then you're all right anyway aren't you mathers he asked course i am what the dickens do you mean oh, nothing uh, glad you like my backy there's plenty of time for another pipe no there isn't said mathers i very much wish there was we walked on a few yards farther do you drink that rich brown cod liver oil the same as nubby asked steggles of mathers suddenly mathers looked at him and i knew how things were in a moment for a moment my own sufferings were forgotten before the awful spectacle of the ruin of mathers he gave his pipe back quietly took great gasps of air mopped his forehead and rolled his eyes about then he said i'm not quite happy about nubs you push on and i'll overtake you hanged if you're not queer too exclaimed steggles whoever would have thought that three castles shut up said mathers hoarsely it was the boy boiled beef at dinner he spoke the words with an awful effort ah, so it was i said feebly we never could stand it either of us a steaming glass of hot grog is what you want said steggles sympathetically go gasped mathers who really looked horrid now go or i'll kick you if it kills me to do it 
blessed if you haven't turned green mathers said steggles you look as if you've been buried and dug up again i don't say it unkindly but it's jolly curious at the same moment ting ting went a bicycle bell and there was milly looking fine you'll all be late she said we prayed she would hurry on and not observe us too narrowly then that beast steggles made her stop look here he said it's frightfully serious because of the match these poor chaps are ill just cast your eye at the colours they've gone they worried me to let em dry to smoke and i'll break your neck for this interrupted mathers then he turned to em if you're a lady if you ever cared an atom about us please ride on round that corner we're ill can't you see it oh yes i can anybody could i'm sorry but you won't hurt steggles if i go said em no i promise say we're on the road and shall be there in ten ten go em took the hint and rode off with steggles frisking beside her like the dog he was thank the lord said mathers then horrid things happened both to him and me we crawled to the match more dead than alive and found a crowd waiting and brown and several of the other masters we were fully twenty minutes late this is very unsportsmanlike the day being so short too brown squeaked then we took off our coats and tottered into the field of play of course buckland grammar school won our side would have done a long way better without us i couldn't take a pass or shoot for the life of me it occupied all my time wrestling with nature let alone the bucklanders and mathers who played back was worse the roughs guyed him and asked him what he'd been drinking if they'd asked him what he'd been smoking there might have been some sense in it he told me afterwards that he often saw three footballs at one time when he tried to kick and sometimes four and the ball he kicked always turned out to be an apparition bradwell kept goal grandly too but it was no good with mathers like that and he utterly ruined ashby major the other back nubs had gone to bed when we got back and the matron knowing nubs had a tricky system sent for dr barnes nubs therefore gave himself away m never looked at any of us again and she and steggles undoubtedly became frightful pals but the next term just before easter i had the pleasure of writing a fine letter to mathers who had left merivale and was reading for six months with a private tutor before going to cambridge this is part of the letter dear mathers i wrote you will be interested to know that brown has come down on steggles at last i fancy brown knew the doctor was fairly sick of steggles and wanted to be rid of him in fact i heard the doctor call steggles a cankerworm myself anyway brown blew up on the smoking and steggles will soon probably vanish like the dew upon the fleece em cried a bit i fancy when she heard of it but nubbs says she smiled at him two mornings afterwards coming out of chapel nubbs expects to crack his voice any day but he hopes to get a definite understanding with m before it happens it'll be too late after of course she never looks at me she told steggles and he told me that she could not possibly care for a person she had once seen the hue of a liberty art fabric meaning me i scragged steggles after he told me but it is all over now i believe he is to go into his father's business steggles and stoat wine merchants m is more beautiful than ever though i'm afraid she's got a bad disposition to reflect on a fellow's colour at such a time as that was a bit rough End of story one Story two of The Human Boy by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story two The Protest of the Wing Dormitory. One. This is the story of the most tremendous thing that ever happened in Dunstan's or any other school, I should think, though in it, luckily, I didn't do any of the big part, being merely one of those chaps who were flogged and not expelled afterwards trelawney and bradwell carried the thing through and all the other fellows in the wing dormitory followed their lead and mind you everybody had the welfare of the school at heart 
it seemed a jolly brave sort of thing to do and jolly interesting trelawney arranged the military side of the business and bradwell whose father is known as the whiteley of some place in yorkshire looked to the commissariat which means feeding as to trelawney who really captained the dormitory he was cornish and a relation of that very chap fifty thousand cornishmen wanted to know the reason why about long ago he was going to be a soldier read history books for choice and already knew many military words i was bradwell's fag at the time because watson minor had failed in some secret enterprise and i remember the first conversation which led to everything happening to take some tuck in to bradwell in the fifth classroom i found trelawney there and heard him say the only way a protest and a jolly dignified one must be made it's for the credit of the school and if the doctor will not see it we must show him i've thought about it a lot and i think if a section of chaps could put themselves in a strong fortified position they might demand to be heard and even be able to offer an uh, uh, ultimatum of course doing the thing for the good of the school and not for ourselves makes us morally right oh of course said bradwell but we must be physically strong in warfare the relative positions of the sides are always taken into account when the treaties of peace are arranged what are you staring at said bradwell to me you hook it so i hooked but i knew perfectly well what they were talking about everybody in the wing dormitory did because they often discussed the same question after they thought the rest of the chaps were asleep it was the new mathematical master thompson who troubled not only trelawney and bradwell but a lot of the other fellows trelawney had called him an unholy bounder the third day he was there and that seemed to be a general opinion yet with all his bounderlishness he was awfully clever and meant well but he didn't know anything about chaps in a general way and he left out his h's and stuck them in with awfully rum effects thompson tried hard to be friendly to everybody but only the kids liked him he couldn't understand somehow and insulted chaps in the most frightful way not seeing any difference between fellows at the top of the school and mere kids at the bottom captains of elevens were as nothing to him he seemed to have read up boys like he read mathematics and stuff from rotten books he would say sometimes now you fellows let's have a jolly game a leapfrog before a bell rings and things like that boys never do play leapfrog except in books really once he offered to show trelawney how to make a kite and he asked chambers chambers mind you the captain of the first eleven at cricket whether he knew a shop where there were capital iron hoops for sale at a shilling each i heard him say it and he put it like this i say chambers do you know those splendid hoops they sell at burford's in high street it's out of bounds but if you like i'll get you one this evening they've got iron crooks and everything i make this offer because you understood a little of what i said about conic sections this afternoon thompson meant so jolly well that nobody could get in a wax with him personally and as i say the kids who didn't see the unholy bounder side of him and only knew he stood gallons of ginger beer on half holidays in the playing fields liked him better than anybody but trelawney took big views and so did bradwell and they decided to make a definite protest nothing happened till one day thompson said something about trelawney's celtic thickness of skull that stung trelawney like nettles and he set to work and arranged the great plot of the wing dormitory he decided that the fifteen chaps who slept in the isolated wing dormitory of dunstan's were to fortify the place and hold it before the world and the doctor as a protest against thompson every chap in the dormitory from trelawney and bradwell to watson minor signed their names in their own blood on a paper trelawney drew out and watson minor fainted while he was doing it not being able to see his own gore on a pen without going off we swore by a tremendous swear to obey trelawney to fortify the wing dormitory against siege to devote every penny of our week's pocket-money to provisions and to hold out till we starved 
having first signed another paper for dr dunstan explaining our united protest against thompson and hoping for the good of the school that he would be removed i didn't understand much about it really in fact i don't believe anybody did but trelawney and bradwell only they said we were acting for the good of the school and they also said that if we held the wing dormitory properly nothing short of cannon or starvation could dislodge us it was a tremendously tall building complete in itself with iron fireproof doors constructed to cut it off from the rest of the school and with a bathroom and a lavatory adjoining all at a great height above the ground the windows were barred to keep chaps getting out the bars would also keep chaps getting in as trelawney pointed out he found also that it was possible when the iron doors were closed to pull down some woodwork and stick things behind the doors so as they could not be opened again the only entrance to the wing dormitory was through these iron doors so once shut we were safe against anything but gunpowder and trelawney said dr dunstan was not the man to resort to physical means especially if it meant knocking the place about bradwell came out wonderfully about the food and knowing jolly well that they would turn the water out of the bathroom when the siege started he made every chap fill his basin and jug the night before because fresh water is vital to a siege there were fifteen chaps and the time came at last and one night we laid the manifesto on the mat outside the iron door made everything fast and waited to see what would happen some fellows thought that thompson would be sent away at once to avoid the affair becoming serious others fancied we should be starved out or expelled to a man trelawney never hazarded any guess at what would be the end of it we are doing our duty in the interests of the school he said and whatever happens we mean well and if it gets into print the sympathy of all chaps in public schools will be on our side Two when the gas was turned out at the meter on the night preceding the siege trelawney made a short speech first he lighted two candles and made us sign the protest then he explained his military system of night and day watches and guards each of the four windows had a guard at all hours and two chaps were to be stationed at the iron door this was made doubly strong by beds piled against it after the manifesto had been finally signed and left outside the document ran thus we the undersigned thinking that the fame of dunstan's is tarnished by mr thompson m a fellow of trinity college cambridge hereby protest and formally assert themselves to call attention to mr thompson we the undersigned have no personal grudge to mr thompson but think him unsuited to carry on the great reputation of dunstan's we the undersigned take this important step fully alive to the gravity of it for we are prepared to suffer if necessary to call attention to the subject we do not doubt mr thompson's goodness and wish it to be understood that the action is abstract and not personal a string will be lowered from the third window of the wing dormitory to-morrow at eight thirty a m any answer to the protest will receive instant attention from us the undersigned and then followed the names of course it was all greek to the kids but they put their trust in trelawney and signed to a kid inside the dormitory we were jolly busy too because after trelawney as commander had made his rules and regulations clear bradwell as the head of the commissariat drew up a list of the total supplies and showed what each fellow had contributed to the store this list i copied for bradwell at the time with notes about the different supplies it comes in here and i must give it just to show what different ideas different chaps have about the things you ought to eat in a siege trelawney two hams eight loaves of bread bradwell three tens potted salmon two seed cakes big box of biscuits ashby major ten ten sardines ashby has five shillings a week pocket money his father being rather rich bradwell said it was rather a pity he spent it all on sardines ashby minor three pats of butter three tens swiss milk one tin guava jelly bradwell was awfully pleased about the milk because he said it was at once nourishing and pleasant to the taste 
wilson six dried herrings two pots veal and ham paste one pot marmalade herrings useless unless eaten raw west four bottles of raspberry vinegar i am west and i thought raspberry vinegar would be a jolly good thing to break the monotony of a siege but bradwell said it was simply a luxury morant one hamper containing twenty-four apples twenty-seven pears two pots of blackberry jam morant has no pocket money but bradwell said the fruit was good for a change gideon nothing gideon is a jew by birth and gets ten shillings a week pocket money he pretended he had forgotten trelawney says he will suffer for it in the course of the siege mathers eight pieces of shortbread five slabs of toffee seven sausage rolls the rolls were cut in half to be eaten first thing before they went bad but bradwell said mathers had made the selection of a fool and so mathers was rather vexed with bradwell nunes ten loaves five brown one packet of beef tabloids trelawney congratulated nunes mckins a lot of spring onions and lettuces costing one and sixpence mckins had been reading a book about chaps getting scurvy on a raft and he thought a siege would be just the place for scurvy so he bought all green stuff and bradwell said it was good corky minimus three pounds of mixed sweets bradwell smacked his head when he heard what corgi minimus had got but trelawney pointed out that a few sweets served out from time to time might distract the mind derbyshire a pigeon pie and thirteen currant buns with saffron on them forest four pots bovril one bottle cider bovril can be taken on bread like treacle and once saved the lives of several shipwrecked sailors watson minor two pounds dog biscuits one pound dried figs one box of dates asked why he took dog biscuits he explained it was because he had seen an advertisement about the goodness of them it said they had dried buffalo meat in them which was a thing you could live for an immense duration of time on trelawney said that it was pretty fair sense for a kid all this splendid food was brought out of boxes where it had been hidden and placed in the hands of bradwell and that night he sat up with a candle and drew out bills of fare and made calculations we were rather surprised in the morning to hear the rations would not last more than a fortnight but trelawney said the siege must be over long before that nobody slept much and many had dressed before the first bell rang when the second bell rang trelawney and bradwell went to the door to listen presently thompson of all people came up and tried to get in and couldn't he shook the door then saw the envelope addressed to the doctor and said what's the meaning of this you fellows let me in at once but nobody answered then he cleared off at eight thirty the string was lowered from the window and trelawney went and stood by it to pull up any letter that might be fastened to it but none was some of the chaps were prowling about outside looking at the wing dormitory but trelawney wouldn't let anybody go to the windows except himself then as nothing happened we had breakfast mckenz and forrest were told off to help bradwell and each chap's rations were put on his bed after he made it we all got the same except gideon a slice of bread two sardines half one of mather's sausage rolls and half a tumbler of water so we began at once to see what a jolly serious thing a siege is and gideon saw it more than we did because he had no sardines and no sausage roll he offered trelawney money for a little more food but trelawney said he shouldn't have as much as one mixed sweet though he might pay gold for it he said you will have barely enough to keep you alive and gideon turned awfully white when he heard it breakfast didn't take more than about five minutes then there was a tremendous knocking at the iron door and bradwell said the trouble had begun but trelawney said it was the summons to a parley anyway we heard the doctor's voice and it wasn't much of a parley strictly speaking because he spoke first and merely gave us two minutes to be in our places downstairs if you don't obey one and all of you said the doctor you must take the consequences as it is they will be sufficiently grave any further offence i shall know how to treat if you please sir said trelawney the string is out of the window we are doing this for the good of the school and 
then he stopped because he had heard the doctor go away he'll try a blacksmith first said forrest then when they find they can't do anything with his iron door he'll send for policemen but nothing was done strangely enough and trelawney made the chaps lie down and sleep if they could in the afternoon because he expected a night attack with ladders to get in it would be necessary to remove the bars from the windows and anybody attempting to do so would of course be at our mercy with the windows open for dinner that day we had one of trelawney's hams cut into fifteen pieces with two rather thin slices of bread one spring onion and three mixed sweets each and as much raspberry vinegar as would go into a bullet mould that wilson had gideon ate the ham like anybody else which shows jews don't refuse pork in any shape at times of siege whatever they say trelawney wouldn't give him any raspberry vinegar but ashby minor let him have one of his mixed sweets which was green and had arsenic in it ashby minor thought it seemed a frightfully long day and nothing being done against us made it longer bradwell tried to cook wilson's herrings with stuff out of a pillowcase but unfortunately failed trelawney explained that dunston was working out tactics and would do something when the moon rose he said our motto was to be defence not defiance but derbyshire said they were going to starve us out like rats so as to reduce the glory as much as possible one or two chaps had private rows that day and trelawney was pretty short and sharp he said we were to regard ourselves as under martial law and he stopped forrest having any tea at all because he looked out of the window and waved his hand to steggles in the playground what made it worse for forrest was that we opened one of his pots of bovril at that very tea and of course he didn't have any but trelawney said it was good discipline and wouldn't let mathers divide his share with young forrest though he wanted to the day dragged out nothing was done and no letter was put on the string then night came and moonlight and trelawney set watches at each window and door with directions to wake him instantly if anything happened or anybody assembled outside below but he didn't sleep really in fact only a few of the kids did bradwell got a bit down in the mouth after dark and i heard him say to trelawney it wasn't turning out like he thought and trelawney said it's always the same when a position is impregnable i could show you a dozen similar sieges in history of course it's the most uninteresting sort of siege when chaps simply sit and see the enemy get to the end of their food supplies but they won't do that with us the day boys will talk and old dunston will raise heaven and earth to keep it out of the printed papers i bet he'll tie something to the string to-morrow some of us tried to take a bright view like trelawney but when we heard him tell bradwell to run no risks and serve out as little bread as possible we felt that he did not really feel as hopeful of a short siege as he seemed just before dusk corky minimus was caught in the act of flinging a letter out of the window addressed to his mother it was torn up and he was cautioned that ended the day and nothing else happened until a quarter to one o'clock then bradwell whose watch it was called cave and came to trelawney with frightful excitement to say that there was the head of a ladder at his window and a man climbing up trelawney was there in a second and asked in a loud voice what the man wanted and said he'd throw the ladder down if the man came up another rung but the man said hush you silly fellow i'm a friend with news from the enemy the least you can do is to hear what i've got to say good lord said trelawney it's thompson and so it was and his huge head soon got level with the window and looked like a bull's against the moonlight trelawney made everybody get out of earshot except bradwell but he didn't happen to see me being rolled up in bed near the window so i heard first thompson said no here you cornish boy i'm sorry to find we haven't at it off by any means and you want me to go and you've locked yourself and friends up here as a protest now how have i hurt your feelings and what have i done which was a bit difficult for trelawney but he fell back on the manifesto to the doctor it's no personal matter sir we wish to be understood that the action is abstract 
oh well i can't say i know what the devil you mean by that but i like you all better than ever and i understand this much that you don't like me i'm not proud i'm quite as ready to learn as to teach tell me what makes you do this you queer things we don't think you are the right man for dunston sir said trelawney firmly well but isn't dr dunston the best judge his experience reaches back rather farther than yours anyway i'm not going you'll have to tolerate me you'll have to like me too i've disobeyed all orders by climbing up here now to advise you to give in to-morrow take my advice and come out at the first bell and with ropes round your necks measures are in hand and as your protest has utterly failed the sooner you give in and take your punishment the better i've done my best to make it as light as i can but boys mustn't do this sort of thing in big schools you know it's very naughty indeed we shall keep up the protest for another day at least sir said trelawney with a lot of side in his voice no my lad you won't answered thompson the doctor has taken my advice and by very simple means with the least possible waste of time trouble and money we shall enter your stronghold to-morrow i am quite good-tempered to-day to-morrow i shall probably be quite cross and ought the matter is in my hands do be good boys and yield while there's time the sooner the better i regret we cannot comply with your terms sir said trelawney i'm not offering any answered mr thompson i only want to make your foolishness fall as light as possible your mother's and father's arts will ache over this headstrong business the parley is ended said trelawney all right said mr thompson i'm afraid you're a hawful little prig trelawney then he went down the ladder and looking out bradwell reported that he saw him taking it back to the gardener's shed in the shrubbery three there is not much more to be said about the protest of the wing dormitory i suppose thompson was better up in tactics really than trelawney anyway he found a weak spot that trelawney never thought of and he ended the siege by half-past seven the following morning about six ashby major whose watch it was reported that the school fire escape was coming round the corner with it appeared mr thompson mr mannering who is an oxford blue and not much smaller than mr thompson the doctor the gardener and the military agent who drills our volunteer corps and teaches gymnastics they put the escape against the wall of the wing dormitory between two windows where it couldn't be reached by us then thompson and mannering went up and the sergeant and gardener followed the doctor waited at the foot of the ladder they'll get through the roof said trelawney i never thought of that trelawney turned awfully rum in the face and tried to think out a way of repelling a roof attack but there wasn't time in about ten minutes or so the end of an iron bar came through the ceiling then followed a regular avalanche of plaster and dust that fell on wilson minor and jolly nearly smothered him then came thompson mannering followed and the gardener and the sergeant dropped after them as quick as lightning of course we were done because only half of us were fighters the rest being kids and trelawney himself being just fifteen and bradwell fourteen and ashby major twelve and a half and i only eleven and a half it was no good we surrender said trelawney surrender you little brute i should think you did yield said mannering who had cut his hand getting the slates off the roof and was in a rare bait you needn't insult a defeated force sir said trelawney keeping his nerve jolly well we are prepared to pay the penalty of failure and having meant well we we don't care but whether we meant well or not i know trelawney and bradwell both got expelled though thompson was said to have tried very hard for them dunston didn't seem to realize what frightfully good motives prompted them to protest against thompson in an abstract way nothing was done to anybody else except ashby major and me and wilson we were flogged by mr mannering for the doctor and he did it as you might expect from a blue as for thompson he stayed on and the protest never got into print and there wasn't much disgrace for trelawney or bradwell after all because the first afterwards got into woolwich ten from the top 
through an army crammers and the second joined his father who was the whiteley of the north i spoke of he wrote to me only a week ago to say that he was getting a hundred pounds a year from his governor for doing much less than he had to do at dunstan's mind you thompson is a jolly good sort really and we know it now and as i heard my uncle say of somebody else i don't suppose it's a matter of life and death whether or no a chap puts his h's in the wrong places if his heart's in the right one end of story two Story three of The Human Boy by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story three Freckles and Frenchy. He was the most peculiar chap that ever came to Merivale, not excepting even Mason, who shot the doctor's wife's parrot with a catapult, and after he had been flogged, offered to stuff it in the face of the whole school, and nearly got expelled freckles was so called owing to his skin which was simply a complicated pattern much like what you can see in any map of the grecian archipelago this arose he thought from his having been born in australia anyway it was rum to see and so were his hands which had reddish down on the backs his eyes were also reddish a sort of mixture of red and grey specks and they glimmered like a cat's when he was angry which was often his real name was maine and he had no side his father had made a big fortune selling wool at sydney and his grandfather was one of the last people to be transported to botany bay through no fault of his own after he had been on a convict ship five years a chap at home confessed on his deathbed that he had done the thing maine's grandfather was transported for so they naturally let maine's grandfather go free and he was so much annoyed about it that he never came back home again but married a farmer's daughter near sydney and settled out there for good maine didn't think great things of england and was always talking about the australian forests of blue gum trees and bush and sneering rather at the size of our forests around merivale though they were good ones he never joined in games but roamed away alone for miles and miles into the country on half holidays and trespassed with a cheek i never saw equalled he could run like a hare especially about half a mile or so which as he explained to me is just about a distance to blow a keeper certainly though often chased he was never caught and never recognized owing to things he did which he had learned in australia and copied from famous bushrangers his great hope some day was to be a bushranger himself and he practised in a quiet way every saturday afternoon making it a rule to go out of bounds always his get-up was fine my name is tomkins called nubby because i happen to have a rather large sort of nose and being fond of the country and not keen on games maine rather took to me and after i had sworn on crossed knives not to say a word to a soul which i never did till freckles left he told me his secrets and showed me his things if you've seen freckles starting for an excursion you wouldn't have said there was anything remarkable about him but really he was armed to the teeth and had everything a bushranger would be likely to want in a quiet place like merivale down his leg was the barrel of an air-gun strong enough to kill any small thing like a cat at twenty-five yards the rest of the gun was arranged inside the lining of his coat and the slugs it fired he carried loose in his trousers pockets round his waist he had a leather belt he got from a sailor for a pound inside the leather was human skin said to be flayed off a chap by cannibal somewhere which was a splendid thing to have for your own if it was true and in the belt a place had been specially made for a knife freckles of course had a knife in it a buoy knife that made you cold to see he never used it but kept it ready and said if a keeper ever caught him he possibly might have to in addition to these things he carried in his coat pockets a little spirit lamp and a collapsible tin pot and a bag of tea he said tea was the very life of men in the bush and that often after a hard escape when he was out of danger he would get away behind a woodstack or under banks of a stream or some such secret place and brew a cup and drink it and feel the better for it 
lastly freckles had a flat lead mask with holes for the eyes and mouth which he always fitted on when trespassing he said it was copied from the helmet ned kelly the king of the bush rangers used to wear but it was not bullet-proof but only used for a disguise we were in the same dormitory and one night when all the chaps had gone to sleep he dressed up in these things and stood where some moonlight came in and certainly looked jolly once as an awful favor me being smaller than him and not fast enough to run away from a man he let me come and see what he did when bush ranging on a half holiday in winter i shan't run my usual frightful risks with you he said because i might have to open fire to save you and that would be very disagreeable to me but i'll trespass a bit and i'll shoot a few things if i can i don't shoot much only for food he made me a mask with tinfoil off chocolate smoothed out and gummed on cardboard but i had no weapons and he said i had better not try and get any we started for the usual walk chaps were allowed to go through a public pine wood to merivale but half through by a place where was a board which warned us to keep the path freckles branched off into some dead bracken and squatted down and put on his mask i also put on mine then he fastened his air-gun together and loaded it and told me to walk six paces behind him and do as he did his eyes were awfully keen and now and then he pointed to a feather on the ground or an old nest or a patch of rum fungus or a crab-apple still hanging on the tree though all the leaves were off once he fired at a jay and missed it then fell down in the fern as if he was shot himself and remained quite motionless for some time he told me that he always did so after firing that he might hear if any one had been attracted by the sound it was a well-known bushman's dodge once we saw a keeper through a clearing and freckles lay flat on his stomach and so did i he knew the keeper well and told me that he had many times escaped from him we waited half an hour and turned to go a different way from that of the keeper then where a glade sloped down to some water and the grass was all dewy and covered with mole hills freckles went to inspect a trap he had set a week before he was collecting skins for a moleskin waistcoat but he said skinning moles was one of the beastliest tasks a hunter ever had however there was a mole caught and he skinned it and wrapped up the skin in leaves and put it in his hat then we had some real sport for on the other side of the glade we saw rabbits lopping about and freckles stalked them through the fern while i waited motionless and finally he shot a young one i wanted to take it back and get cook to do it for us but he said i was a fool if you want any you must have it now it's about the time i take a meal he said and that's a part of my ranging and hunting you haven't seen yet he knew the country well and said we were in one of the most carefully preserved places anywhere about which must have been true for there were an awful lot of pheasants calling in the glades but freckles got down into a drain and showed me a hollow he had scooped out under a lot of ivy where it fell over a bank this is one of my caves he said and here we can feed and drink in safety but you mustn't talk or i shan't be able to hear if anything is stirring in the woods he took off his mask set down his gun and lighted his spirit stove skin the rabbit and cut off his hind legs while i make tea he said so i did and he held them over the lamp till they were slightly cooked outside but not right through he ate and drank with his ears straining for every sound then he took the rest of the rabbit and removed all traces of eating and buried everything we had left if i didn't he explained some keeper's dog would find my lair and make a row and give it away and the keepers would doubtless lie in wait for me and catch me red-handed you can't be too careful because every man's hand against you which of course is the beauty of it we got back without anything happening and i've hated the sight of rabbit pretty well ever since but freckles said the juices of animals are better for the human frame underdone well that gives you an idea of freckles and the affair with frenchy which i'm going to tell you about showed that he really was cut out for bush ranging frenchy as we called him was monsieur michel he didn't belong entirely to dunston's but lived in merivale and came to us three days a week and went to a girls school the other three 
he was a rum oldish chap whose great peculiarities were to make puns in english and to appeal to our honour about everything he would slang a fellow horribly one day and wave his arms and pretty nearly jump out of his skin and the next day he would bring up a whacking pear for the fellow he'd slanged or a new knife or something he pretty nearly cried sometimes and he told us his nerves were frightfully tricky and often led him to be harsh when he didn't mean it he couldn't keep order or make chaps work if they didn't choose and Streggles, who had an awfully cunning dodge of always rubbing him up the wrong way and then looking crushed and broken-hearted so as to get things which he did said that frenchy was like a damp fireworks because you never knew exactly when he'd go off or how one day dashing out of class with a frightful yell freckles got sent for and went back and found monsieur raving mad it seemed that freckles had yelled too soon before he was out of the classroom in fact and frenchy had got palpitation of the heart from it he led into freckles properly then he said he was his bete noir and un sort à vingt quatre carats which means an eighteen carat ass in english but twenty four carats in french and one of the aborigines who ought to be kept on a chain and many other such like things freckles turned all colours and then white with a sort of bluish tint to his lips he didn't say a word but looked at frenchy with such a frightful expression that i felt something would happen later all that happened at the time was that freckles got the eighth book of telemachus to write out into french from english and then correct by fenelon which was a pretty big job if a chap had been fool enough to try and do it and m michel went off to merivale with a big card on his coat-tail with ici on parle francais written upon it in red pencil this i had managed to do myself while frenchy was jawing freckles i told freckles but it didn't comfort him much he said there were some things no mortal chap could stand and to be called an aborigine because a man was born in australia seemed to him about the bitterest insult even an old frog-eating frenchman could have invented happening to him of all chaps it was especially a thing which would have to be revenged seeing what his views were he said i couldn't bush range or anything with a clear conscience in the future if i had a thing like this hanging over me unrevenged it's the frightfulest slur on my character and i won't sit down under it for fifty frenchmen then he said he should take a week to settle what to do and went into the playground alone next time a frenchy came up he was just the same as ever awfully easy-going and jolly and let freckles off the telemachus and offered him as classy a knife with a corkscrew and other things including tweezers as ever you saw just the knife for freckles considering his ways but it didn't come off freckles got white again when he saw the knife and said thank you monsieur i don't want your knife and the imposition is half done and will be finished next time you come then frenchy called him a silly boy and tried to make a joke and pinch freckles by the ear but nobody saw the joke and freckles dodged away then frenchy sighed and looked round to see who should have the knife and didn't seem to see anybody in particular and left it on his desk he often sighed in class and sometimes told us he was without friends unless he might call us friends and we said he might when he went freckles told me he considered the knife was another insult then he explained what he was going to do he said i shall finish the impot first so as not to be obliged to him for anything and then i shall stick him up stick him up how i said it's a bush-ranging expression he explained to stick up a man is to make him stand and deliver what he's got i see my way to do this with frenchy he always goes and comes from merivale through the woods as you know and now he's up here on friday nights coaching slade and betterton for their army exam afterwards he has supper with mr thompson or the doctor there you are i wait my time in the wood which is jolly lonely by night though it is such a potty little place hardly worth calling a wood then he comes along and i stick him up it's highway robbery i said you might get years and years of imprisonment oh i might he said but i shan't you must begin your career sometime and i'm going to next friday night 
i've often got out of the dormitory and been in that wood by night and only the chaps in the dormitory have known it well the night came and all that we heard about it till afterwards was that about eleven o'clock or possibly even later than that there was a fearful peeling at the front door of dunston's and looking out we could see a stretcher and something on it that something was actually freckles though the few chaps who knew what was going to be done felt sure it must be frenchy because freckles is five feet ten and growing and frenchy isn't more than five feet six at the outside and a poor thing at that but it was freckles all right and two laboring men had brought him back and frenchy had come with them not until five weeks afterwards when freckles could get up and limp about did i hear the truth and i'll tell it in his own words because they must be better than a chap's who wasn't there he seemed frightfully down in the mouth and said that he could never look fellows in the eyes again but it cheered him telling me and when i told him he was thundering well out of it he admitted he was he said well, i got off all right and the moon was as clear as day and everything just ripe for sticking a chap up then like a fool having a longish time to wait i didn't simply stop in shadow behind a tree trunk or something in the usual way but thought i'd do a thing i'd never heard of bushrangers doing though indian thugs are pretty good at it i went and got up a tree which has a branch over the road and thought i'd drop down almost on top of frenchy to start with and that's just what i did do only i dropped wrong and came down pretty nearly on my head owing to slipping somehow at the start what did exactly happen to me as i left the tree i never shall know anyway frenchy came along sure enough and i dropped and he jumped i should think fully a yard in the air but that was all because in falling i hit a big root it was a beech tree and went and broke something in my ankle and something in my chest and couldn't stand consequently of course i couldn't stick him up the pain was pretty fair but feeling what a fool i was seemed to make me forget it anyway finding it was useless to think of sticking him up i tried to hobble into the fern and get out of sight and finding i could not crawl i rolled but of course you can't roll away from a chap and he came after me and my mask fell off while i rolled and he recognized me mon dieu it is the boy main he said speak child what in the wide world was this i disguised my voice and said i wasn't main and that he'd better leave me alone or it might be the worse for him yet but he wouldn't go and chancing to get queer about the head somehow i went off i suppose though it wasn't for long when i came to he was gone but he rushed back in a minute with that rotten old top hat he wears full of water he'd got from the puddle in the stone pit he doused my head and made me sit up with my back against a tree then feeling the frightfulness of it i begged him to clear out and let me alone i said you don't know what you're doing i'm no friend to you but the deadliest enemy you've got in the world and if i hadn't fallen down at a critical moment and broken myself i should have stuck you up monsieur michel so now you know he said to himself the poor mad boy the poor mad boy i will run a toute jambe for succor but i told him not to i began to get a rum hot pain in my side then but i felt i would gladly have died there rather than be obliged to him i said you called me an aborigine which is the most terrible thing you can call an australian born chap and you wanted to pass it off with a knife with a corkscrew and tweezers in it but you couldn't expect me to take it feeling as i did now the fortunes of war have given you the victory and if you please i wish you'd go but he refused he said he wouldn't have hurt my feelings for anything he seemed to overlook altogether what i was going to do to him and asked me where it hurt me i told him and he said it was his fault fancy that and wished he was big enough to carry me back i kept on asking him to go and at last after begging my pardon like anything for about a week it seemed he went but i heard him shouting and yelling french yells in the woods and after a bit he came back with two men and a hurdle they presently took me back and what frenchy said since to the doctor i don't know in fact i didn't know anything for days anyway i've had nothing but a mild rowing and a very good grub and i'm not to be even flogged though that's probably because i broke a rib or two not including the bone in my leg 
but i'm all right now and i think it was about the most sporting thing a chap ever did for frenchy to treat me like that hm i shouldn't have thought it was in a frenchman to do it especially after i told him what i was going to do yes i said that's all right but what about bush ranging it's pretty sickening he said but i feel as if all the keenness was knocked out of me if a chap can't so much as fall out of a tree on a wanderer's path at the nick of time without smashing himself what's the good of him besides i said if it hadn't been frenchy but somebody else of a different turn of mind he might have taken you at a disadvantage and jolly well killed you in real bush ranging that is what would have happened admitted freckles as it is i expect months perhaps years will have to go by before i feel to hanker after it again and meantime i shan't rest in peace till i've paid frenchy how i asked well i believe it's to be done he's often come to see me while i was on my back in bed and he's told me a lot about himself he's frightfully hard up and a roman catholic and hopes to lay his bones in la belle france with luck but he doesn't think he'll ever be able to manage it he told me all this little knowing my father was extremely rich well you see the mater wants somebody french for the kids at home which are girls and knowing frenchy bars this climate i think australia might do him good he's fifty-three years old and it seems to me if the governor rode and offered him his passage and a good screw he'd go i have made it a personal thing to myself and told the governor what a good little chap he is and what a beautiful accent he's got and the thing that happened in the wood the affair dropped then and about six weeks after when freckles was getting fit again he walked with me one half holiday to see the place where he was smashed up the bow was a frightful high one to drop from even in daylight also it was broken freckles got awfully excited when he spotted it there there he said that's the best thing i've seen for twelve weeks i don't see much to squeak about i said especially as the beastly tree nearly did for you but can't you see it's broken that's what did it i thought i slipped and if i had i shouldn't have been made of the stuff for a bush ranger but the wretched branch broke and that is jolly different that wasn't my fault the most hardened old hand must have come down then in fact he couldn't have stopped up oh what a lot of misery i'd have been saved through all these last weeks if i'd known it broke in a natural sort of way he got an awful deal of comfort out of this and said he should return to his old ways again as soon as he could run a mile without stopping and we found his lead mask like ned kelly's just where it had dropped when he had rolled over in the fern and he welcomed it like a dog that's the end except that his father did write to dunston about french and dunston not being very keen about frenchy himself seemed to think he would be just the chap for the girls of freckle's father anyway he went and he cried when he said good-bye to the school and freckles told me that when he said good-bye to him he yelled with crying and blessed him both in french and english and said that the sunny atmosphere of australia would very likely prolong his life until he had saved enough to get his bones back to france so he went and freckles went after him much sooner than he ever expected to because the keepers finally caught him in the game preserves sitting in his hole under the stream bank frizzling the leg of a pheasant which he had shot out of a tree with his air gun and buried seven days before and dunston wrote to his father and his father wrote back that freckles being now fourteen and apparently having less sense than when he left australia had better return to his native land and go into the wool business and begin life as an office boy in his place of business freckles told me that chaps in his father's office generally got a fortnight's holiday but that his mother would probably work up his governor to give him three weeks then he would get a proper outfit and track away to the boundless scrub and fall in with other chaps who had similar ideas and began to take life seriously he said i might see his name in australian newspapers in about a year but he never wrote to me and i don't know if he really succeeded well i'm sure i hope he did for he was a tidy chap though queer End of story three.
story four of the human boy by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story four concerning corky minimus one if corky minor had been at school that term the thing would never have come about but corky minor was always one of the lucky chaps and just when in the ordinary course of events he would have had to begin fagging for an exam something happened to his right lung and he had to go on an awful fine trip to australia in a sailing ship that left corky major who was a mere learning machine in the sixth and corky minimus who was ten and in the lower fourth it began like this after bray had licked derbyshire and bethune which he did one after the other on the same half holiday chaps gave him best as a matter of course and he became cock of the lower school he was solid muscle all through and harder than stone and he had a brother in london who was runner-up in the amateur lightweight championship two years following bray fancied himself a bit naturally and was always roaming about seeking fellows to punch but once out of bounds in a private wood a keeper caught him and licked him which was seen by two other fellows and remembered against bray afterwards when he put on too much side he and corky minimus were in the same class because bray though thirteen didn't know much at first they were great chums and bray bossed corky and palled with him and when brown the under mathematical master told corky minimus that he was the least of all the corkies and not worthy to be called a corky because he couldn't do rule of three or some rot bray said a thing that brown overheard and got sent up but by degrees the friendship of bray and corky minimus cooled off and the matter of milly settled it the doctor had four daughters and milly was the youngest mabel and ethel held no dealings with any fellows under the sixth and mary had something wrong with her spine and didn't count but i never cared for any of them myself because you couldn't tell what they meant beatrice for instance was absolutely engaged to morris for he told his sister so in the holidays and his sister told morris minor and he told me the next term morris was the head of the school and he had her photograph fixed into a foreign nut which he wore on his watch chain but when he left and she found out he was gone into a bank at eighty pounds a year she dropped him like a spider mind you morris had told her he was descended on his mother's side from a race of old irish kings which may have unsettled her anyway when she found he came on his father's side from a race of church curates she wrote and said it was off but there were other things that upset the chumming of bray and corky minimus before the milly row and they ought to be taken in turn first there was the old testament prize which was the only thing bray had the ghost of a chance of getting but corky beat him by twenty-three marks and bray said afterwards that corky had cribbed a lot of stuff about joshua and corky said he hadn't and even declared he knew as much about joshua as bray and a bit over then on top of that came the match with neckties which was rather a rum match in its way both of them used to be awfully swagger about their neckties and each fancied his own so one bet the other half a crown he would wear a different necktie every day for a month the month being june that meant thirty different neckties each and the chap who wore the best neckties would win a fellow called fowl was judge being the son of an artist and neither bray nor corky was allowed to buy a single new tie or add to the stock he had in his box at the end of a fortnight they stood about equal though corky's ties were rather more artistic than bray's which were chiefly yellow and spotted but then came an awful falling away and some of the affairs they wore were simply weird the test for these was if the tie passed in class then the terms of the match were altered and they decided to go on wearing different things till one or other was stopped by a master any concern not noticed was considered a necktie in the ordinary acceptation of that term as fowl put it at the end of the third week corky minimus came out in an umbrella cover done in a sailor's knot but nobody worth mentioning spotted it 
and the next day bray wore a bit of blue ribbon off a chocolate box which also passed they struggled on this sort of a way till bray got bowled over i think corky was wearing a yard measure dipped in red ink that morning but it looked rather swagger than not class was not ended when old briggs of all people a man who wore two pairs of spectacles at one time very often said to bray what is that around your neck boy and bray said my tie sir then briggs said is it sir let me see it please i have noticed an increasing disorder about your neck arrangements for a week past you insult me and you insult the class by appearing here in these ridiculous ties it shan't happen again sir said bray trying to edge out of the classroom no bray it shall not said old briggs bring me that thing at once please bray handed it up and briggs examined it as if it was a botanical specimen or something this he announced is not a necktie at all you're wearing a piece of brussels carpet wretched boy a fragment of the new carpet laid down yesterday in the doctor's study you will kindly take it to him immediately say who sent you and state the purpose to which you were putting it so bray by the terms of the match lost and corky minimus won with the yard measure then the feeling between them grew especially after bray said that he could only pay his half-crown in installments of a penny a week now we come to milly you see she was corky minor's great pal the term before but now that he was at sea and thousands of miles off she chucked him and turned to corky minimus that shows what she was really anyway in a bad moment for young corky she told him he had eyes like an eagle's and it simply turned his head as an eagle's eyes are yellow i couldn't see myself what there was to be so jolly pleased about but he was and to show you what a chap may come to if a girl collars him i know for a fact that corky minimus tried to paint a picture for her whether he actually succeeded i cannot say but he went down four places in class and got awfully dropped on by brown then came that attempt of bray to cut corky out and being myself a tremendous personal chum of corky's i wished he had succeeded but he didn't and even his fighting didn't take milly after a month of giving her things to eat and so on he said it was his red hair that stood between them and told fowl he didn't care a straw about her but from the way he went on to corky minimus any fool could see he really cared a lot the chap called fowl comes in here this obscene fowl as we called him out of virgil being really a term in a crib applied to harpies though he would have run if a mouse had squeaked at him was yet responsible for more fights than any fellow in the school he sneaked about asking chaps if they gave one another best and when at last he found two who didn't funk each other though they might be perfectly good friends he never rested until there was a fight he got kicked sometimes but not enough that was owing to the fact that his hampers from home were most extraordinary they came on roman feast days because he was a roman catholic by religion and some fellows even said that the more you kicked fowl the more you were likely to get from the hampers that was rot of course and a jolly suspicious thing happened once Nunes, a chap in the lower fifth kicked fowl the very morning before a hamper came and that same evening after prayers fowl gave Nunes about half a whacking big melon and the next day Nunes jolly near died fowl swore he hadn't put anything in the melon but it was bosh to say that half a melon if it's all right is going to do a chap any harm anyway we rather funked fowl's hampers afterwards well this wretched obscene fowl met me one day licking his fat lips and showing great excitement so i knew he'd probably worked up a fight but it wasn't that though something worse he said where's corky minimus bray wants him what for i said i may mention that i am called mckins as a matter of fact he's heard something and he says though he's sorry he's got to lick corky fowl smacked his beastly mouth as if he'd got pineapple drops in it what's corky done i said it's about milly dunstan young corky talks jolly big with her and doesn't even speak civil of his friends 
by quite an accident i was passing through the shrubbery from brown's house to the chapel yesterday and i went by the summer-house which is out of bounds and couldn't help overhearing milly and corky minimus who were there and corky distinctly said that bray was as fiery as his hair and that he had no more control of himself than a burning mountain and milly laughed and you sneaked off and told bray as his chum i had to ah then i shall tell corky what you heard being his chum i shouldn't said fowle it's only making mischief besides bray won't take an apology now he says he stood all that flesh and blood can stand those were his very words in fact i'm looking for corky minimus at this moment to tell him that bray wants him up in the gym to lick him fowle smacked his lips again he's brought it on himself well i said i'll give the message you can go back and tell bray you've told me i'd rather have done it myself said fowle regretfully as though he was being robbed of tuck well you won't i answered him being pretty sick with the worm of a chap by that time you go back and say that corky will turn up in ten minutes then he cleared out reluctantly leaving this tremendous responsibility entirely on my hands Two i went off there and then for corky it's a bit of a jar for a chap to get a message like that unexpectedly and i didn't know what advice to give corky major was no good if i told him he would have blinked through his goggles and have said some bosh very likely in latin and corky minor being thousands of miles away it looked blue because you can't ask anybody but a chap's own brothers to take up a matter like this i couldn't lick bray myself or i would have the next minute i met corky himself and from an awful rum look about him i thought for a moment he'd had the licking already but he hadn't and before i could speak he said mckins i've got to fight bray my dear chap you couldn't i began i know he answered but i've got to things have happened listen to this i've just left milly and she's in a frightful bait i shouldn't have thought a girl could have got in such a rage without hurting herself bray told fowle that there were as good fish in the sea as ever came out of it meaning milly and fowle wrote it on a bit of paper and dropped it where milly was bound to see it he didn't put his name but she knows his writing now she's pretty well mad and said it's a disgrace that a thick-necked speckly stumpy chap like bray should be cock of the lower school well i said very likely it was but i didn't see how it could be helped him being such a fighter then she tossed her hair about and said i won't have anything more to do with the lower school at all while he's cock of it of course i didn't think she included me being well her greatest pal alive since corky minor went so i said quite right i shouldn't look at them then she turned round rather suddenly and said i was included so i said i should be only too glad to fight him if there was a ghost of a chance but there isn't it's no good pretending he's four inches taller and miles more round the chest and round the arms and ages older in fact he could lick me with one hand tied behind him then she said the days of chivalry are dead which she'd got out of a book of course and she added that she was tired of all boys and that a chap with eyes like mine ought to have more devil in him yes she used that word i said what do you want me to do and she said oh nothing i wouldn't have a hair of your head singed for the world only i thought that it might interest you more than other people to know i'd been insulted of course if it's nothing to you then she stopped and marched away and i went after her and asked her to explain and she answered that the explanation ought to come from me she said do you ever read dragon stories and i said yes then she went on well in all the ones i've read if a lady asked anybody to kill a dragon the person didn't say that the dragon could beat him with one paw tied behind it even though he thought so but he jolly well went and did the best he could naturally after that i saw what she meant and i said oh all right milly of course if you've been insulted i must make the beggar apologize or try to yes she said cheering up like anything you are my own precious champion and i love you i tell you all this because you're my chum and you'll have to be my second and if i can even black his eye before he settles me it will be something well i call it a shoes i said she might as well have asked you to fight blanchard or sims 
look at your arms not to mention anything else they're like cabbage stalks yes i know all that said corky minimus and it'll be rather rotten for her if he kills me but the thing's got to be done and the sooner it's over the better then i suddenly remembered bray's message and told corky he seemed surprised he can't lick me on the spot if i challenge him to fight in a regular way can he he asked but rather doubtfully i said it seemed to me he couldn't then we went up to the gym where bray was talking to about four chaps including fowl oh you've come you kid have you you'd better not keep me waiting another time when i send for you he began now i'm going to lick you for cheek what cheek corky minimus said fowl heard you say i was as fiery as my hair oh fowl he hears a lot i know did you say it or didn't you yes i did and i say it again and you're a dirty bully too bray came quite close to corky minimus and put his face so near that their noses were almost touching like cats do when they're going to have a row on a wall say that once more if it isn't troubling you too much said bray i'll say it as often as you like answered young corky keeping his eye on brace and i'll say another thing too which is that before you talk so big about me being a kid and licking me you'd better find out first if i give you best golly said bray grinning like mad don't you no i don't and i'll fight you properly with seconds the first minute we can Corky Minimus had certainly come out of it fine so far, and I only wished he could fight as well as he talked. Of course, from Bray's point of view, it was the best thing that could have happened, because now he had a right to lick Corky, and a right to lick him as badly as he could. The bell rang a minute afterwards, and going in, it was settled the fight should come off next Wednesday, that being a half-holiday part of merivale woods skirted the cricket field and as the second eleven to which bray belonged wasn't playing a match everything suited very comfortably blanchard the cock of the school agreed to umpire and he and another chap in the fifth very kindly promised to carry young corky home by a secluded way if he was too much smashed to walk fowl seconded bray and i saw bray teaching him how to fan with a towel and spurt water over a fellow's face between the rounds of course it was about as good fun as killing rats with a stick for bray three corky minimus saw milly once or twice before the fight and he said he couldn't make out whether she was going mad or what one minute she wanted him to fight and the next she implored him not to one minute she hoped he would mutilate bray to pieces the next she blubbed and prayed him if ever he had any liking for her to give bray best she said she kept dreaming of him brought back stark and stiff and then when he began to think she meant it she called him her knight and her hero and her king arthur and other frightful rot and actually wanted him to wear one of her sunday gloves under his shirt at the time of fighting corky minimus said he very likely wouldn't wear a shirt and then she thought he might hang it i mean the glove round his neck by a bit of string blessed if i shall ever feel quite the same to her after this said corky it seems rather rough to get broken up for life to please a skimpy girl i said then he burst out as red in the face as an apple and told me he would not hear a word against milly so i dried up there were three days before the fight and corky minimus trained for it and gave away his pudding at dinner in exchange for the meat of the chaps who sat next to him but you can't get your muscle up in a day or two like that and it only made him awfully thirsty the day came at last and i may as well go on to the fight itself the first were having a big match on our own ground so nobody paid any attention to us and we arranged a game that should have corky bray and me on the same side then when our chaps were in we three sneaked away into the plantations behind some holly trees and a wood stack bray arranged all the preliminaries as cheerful as a bird and blanchard said they were right they marked out a ring and ran a string round and arranged corners for the seconds i saw that the obscene fowl had towels and bottles of water and a basin all of course for bray between the rounds 
corky minimus was rather waxy with me for not bringing the same for him but i'd brought a sponge which i know is a thing a second chucks up in the air when his man is done for and i explained and showed it to corky and he thanked me and said he supposed that was about the only thing he should want blanchard said the rounds were to be two minutes long each and bray grumbled because they ought by rights to be three but blanchard told him to shut up and begin when he saw bray take his shirt off i told corky he ought to and he did then blanchard laughed and said by gum they peel rather different bray was like a barrel with muscles a lot bigger than hen's eggs on his arms corky minimus seemed to be all ribs somehow with arms about as lean as rulers i told him to keep moving about and try and puff bray a bit if he had time and he said all right i'll try if i can get a smack at his face so as to black an eye or something and show i've hit him before he does for me i don't care i will say for corky minimus that he had about the best pluck i ever saw in a chap he was quite calm and just his usual colour and when bray tossed him for corners corky won and blanchard said i picked the right corner for him then he told them to fight fair and said a time i'd prayed corky to try and surprise bray at the very start if he could and have a hit at bray's face the moment they began and i'm blessed if he didn't go and do it bray began fiddling about jolly scientifically with his hands and i fancy he just squinted down to see if his feet were scientific too at the same moment corky buzzed round his right and let bray have it fairly on the nose bray jumped and looked about as much surprised as if he'd been struck by lightning and blanchard said first blood for corky minimus i yelled i oughtn't to have but i did because to see blood dropping about on bray's chest was a fine sight he sniffed and went for corky smiling the smile was the beastliest part of it for i hoped he would have got his wool off a bit and been wild but he wasn't and when he began to hit corky got flustered and swung about like a windmill and caught it pretty hot yet he jerked his head so jolly quick that he didn't get more than about four smacks on it in the first round though his body which was white by nature was pretty soon covered with red marks he said they didn't hurt and i cleaned him up and blew water over him at the end of the round his lip was bleeding like mad but luckily inside where his tooth had cut it and he swallowed all the blood so nobody knew besides which the blood wasn't lost bray flung himself down in his corner and fowl looked after him and even at a solemn time like that i laughed and so did corky minimus because fowl tried to be too clever and spurted a lot of water out of his mouth into bray's eye then bray told him that after the fight he'd tie him in knots and kick him looking forward to which of course wrecked fowl's enjoyment entirely blanchard said time again awfully soon and i saw bray meant settling corky now because his reputation as a fighter was at stake and he knew corky hoped to get through three rounds with luck so bray began hitting him like hammers and though i was about as sorry for corky minimus as a chap could be nobody would have been able to help admiring the way bray hit it was just at the end of this round when corky had been knocked down once but got up again that the awful rum thing with milly dunstan happened suddenly without any warning there was a noise like fowls getting up a hedge and she rushed out from behind the woodstack with her eyes blazing and her hair streaming like a comet in a bait she'd been running a good way i should think and she tore right into the ring straight at bray and not trusting to words at a time like that and not remembering her father was a clergyman or anything slapped his face both sides and jolly hard too bray swore the horriblest words i ever heard used by a chap because she'd given him more in half a second than corky could have in a year then he got into his shirt upside down and hooked it with fowl but not before he heard her say you little fat red-headed coward to fight and try and murder a boy half your age and size i wish i could kill you i do it's shameful to think you're an english boy at all then she turned on the chaps from the fifth and told blanchard he was a disgrace to the school 
so they cleared out too and then she cried over corky and said she would rather have been torn to pieces by unchained monsters than have let him be mangled like he was and corky who was pretty well dazed forgave her and told her kindly to go away and she gasped and gurgled and went i took corky back and one or two things got to be known it came out that fowle had told milly the place and the hour of the fight but only after she had sworn on some rotten saint fowle knew that she would not tell a single soul about it she kept her swear all right but came herself and when bray got to hear how it was she came of course thinking corky had told her which he would rather have died than do then bray tried a lot of chinese tortures on fowl that he'd seen at a waxworks and chaps who saw it said that fowl was so excited at the time that he called upon about twenty different well-known bible characters by name to come and help him and destroy bray but they didn't as for corky minimus the things he got from milly after that fight you wouldn't believe there were bottles of stuff to rub bruises with and lozenges and grapes and some muck for his eye and little baskets of strawberries and jolly books and rosebuds she told the doctor about slapping bray's face and wrote a long letter of apology afterwards and a week later she broke it to corky minimus that she was going to a boarding school herself next term which she did when corky told me about it he added and she's going to write me letters because she said several times that there's only one chap in the world for her now and i'm the chap i shouldn't think she could change her mind after all that's happened i said and corky minimus said i bet she will when corky minor turns up again especially if he brings rum things with him from australia and you needn't repeat it but to you mckins as my chum i say that i don't care how soon he does come back either which showed that there was more sense in corky minimus than you might have thought End of story four. Story five of the Human Boy by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story five: The Piebald Rat. It was all the result of Old Briggs asking the doctor if he might instill the lads with a wholesome fondness for natural history. That's how he put it, because I heard him, and the doctor said it was an admirable notion and would very probably keep some boys out of mischief on half holidays it also kept some boys out of bounds on half holidays and after a time i think the doctor was pretty savage with old briggs and wished he'd stuck to his regular work which was writing and drawing and such like because when one or two of the chaps really got keen about natural history and even chucked cricket for butterflies and beetles others who didn't care a straw about it pretended they did to gain their own ends and it was these chaps if you understand who finally made the doctor so sick with natural history generally and old briggs for starting it my chum west began the rage for study of our humble relations as old briggs called everything down to woodlice he let it be generally known that he had two live lizards in his desk and this being the best thing that west had ever thought of the idea caught on well i had a dormouse myself my name being ashby minor and ashby major kept a spider pretty nearly as big as a young bird which he had poked out of a hole in the playground wall he caged it in a tin match-box and fed it with bluebottles and wasps at least he got bluebottles and wasps for it but the fool wouldn't eat them and after a week he found it with its legs all tucked up as neatly as anything only it was dead i thought the match-box must have been too tight a fit for it but ashby major did not he believed there was something about a tin match-box which must be rather poisonous for outdoor spiders then chaps went on collecting till it got to be swagger to keep big live things in your desk and the bigger the thing the more swagger it was maine generally known as freckles had a couple of guinea pigs in his desk for a week then mannering the classical master in the fifth who must have had a nose like a gimlet smelt them at prayers happening to come in late and kneeling down by freckles at the time the doctor didn't make much fuss then because that was just at the beginning of the business only he said a desk was not the place for guinea pigs and added that a chap in freckles position in the school ought to have known it 
he let the gardener look after them from that time forward but freckles naturally lost all interest in them after the gardener had them because a guinea pig merely as a guinea pig is nothing anyhow it was rough on him to be landed over it because as a matter of fact guinea pigs have no scent worth mentioning and nobody but mannering would have spotted them after that gideon and brooks caught a blind worm one foot two inches long and gideon sold his half for five pence so brooks got it all nobody knew what a blind worm likes to eat unfortunately and it died but not for a fortnight then there was another scene with my dormouse which led to tremendous things there's a hole in a desk where the ink pot goes in and one day my mouse got out through it having climbed up two dictionaries and a greek testament to do so it happened old briggs himself was taking the lower fourth which is my class and i hoped it would be all right but he didn't seem friendly over it and i noticed when he told us to find the mouse he put his feet upon the rungs of his chair it's a rum thing about old briggs that he doesn't care much for natural history objects while they're alive he likes them dead and dried or stuffed and pinned on cards or in glass cases all labelled and neat my dormouse gave us a jolly good hunt round then it finally tripped over a lead pencil and got its tail and hind legs into west's ink so we caught it and i was drying it with a piece of blotting paper and old briggs was just telling us that dormice belong to a genus of rodents called meoxis and are allied to mice though they have a squirrel's habits which he seemed to think was a pity when dunstan came in the doctor asked particulars looked as if he could have jolly well killed my mouse which was shivering rather badly owing to the ink on its hinder parts and said once for all that he would allow no animals of any kind inside any of the desks or in school then unluckily as an afterthought he demanded a clearance on the spot and he was pretty well staggered to find the result i will ask you for ours as head boy of the class and one i am happy to think above any of this childish folly to inspect the desks one by one and report to me where you find indications of life said the doctor Ferrars is always right with the doctor, chiefly because he has a face like a stone angel in church, and a very smooth voice, and a remarkably swagger knowledge of the scriptures. He is also a tremendous worker, and will go into the upper fourth next term as sure as eggs. It was jolly awkward for Ferrars then, because he happened to be one of the keenest natural history chaps of all, and had a piebald rat, which even fellows in the sixth had offered him half a crown and three shillings for, yet he would not part with it. So, though we didn't like him much, we felt almost sorry for the fix he was in now. Of course, we thought that such a demon on religious knowledge as Ferrars would drag out his piebald rat right away, and perhaps even give it to the doctor, or offer to sell it for the almsbox. But he didn't. He got up, rather white about the gills, and opened the desks one by one, and a jolly happy family it was only the doctor scattered the things to the four winds till there wasn't an atom of natural history left in the whole classroom except ferrars piebald rat snug in his desk first fowl who goes in for water things had to empty his jam jar of tadpoles out into the playground which was a beastly cruel thing to make him do because they all died still being in the gill stage then freckles was sent off with a young rabbit to the hayfield and he got caned too because strangely enough the doctor hadn't forgotten his guinea pigs and morant's two sparrows were let go which was no kindness to them because morant had cut their wings so jolly short it would have taken them months to grow enough feathers to fly with and meantime a cat got them both and playfair's mole which by the way had been queer for some time owing to having no earth to burrow in was ordered to be sent to the cricket field there were a lot of other things but corky minima scored rather because his goat sucker moth laid a hundred and fourteen eggs on todd hunter's algebra a few hours before it was let free corky minimus says a goat sucker moth's nothing worth mentioning after it's laid eggs but the eggs turn into fine caterpillars 
the few things the doctor didn't know what to do with and didn't like to have killed he said must be given to the gardener he thought it would be better to put my mouse out of its misery and turned it over on my hand with a gold pencil case and said it had probably got a chill to its vital organs and would die but old briggs explained that it might live if put in cotton wool so the gardener looked to it and it did live and i took it home at the end of that term and have it still though it is getting oldish now and has lost half its tail but it's a good mouse yet of course the extraordinary thing was ferrars after the doctor had gone old briggs to whom he had whispered something before he went gave out that his natural history half hours would be suspended for the rest of the term then i got a word with ferrars i said how ever did you have the cheek you supposed to be such a saint he said i don't know something came over me to do it i've got a jolly peculiar feeling to that rat it's not an ordinary rat i'm wrapped up in it even my respect for the doctor couldn't stand against it i know what you chaps think i dare say you reckon i'm a hound but i couldn't help doing what i did somehow that rat's a sort of mascot to me a mascot's a thing that brings luck all my best luck's happened since i had it of course when a chap goes on like that what can you do i didn't understand ferrars he seemed to me to be simply talking rot so i said well it's pretty measly considering the opinion the doctor's got of you i shan't try to score off your rat because i know it's a jolly fine one and i like it but freckles or somebody will very likely kill it after this he looked in a fair funk when the dreaded thought of having his rat killed came to him before the end of that day he spoke to every chap in the class separately and all but three promised and swore not to lay a finger on the rat but freckles murdoch and morant wouldn't swear finally he paid morant sixpence and so got him over and murdoch he let crib off him and prep three times and freckles who was an awfully sportsmanlike chap really said he was only rotting all the time and would be the last to do a classy rat like ferrars any harm in fact he said he'd much sooner kill ferrars himself mind you though of course it was simply barbarous for ferrars to think that his piebald rat could have any effect on his work yet he proved to me that his success in school and his great popularity with the doctor dated from the coming of the thing when he first got it it was a mere cub rat so to say now though not a year old it had turned into as fine a rat as you could wish to meet anywhere in appearance it had pink eyes and a white head and a fairish amount of white fur about the body which got thinner on its stomach so that you could see the pink skin through to some extent but the piebaldness of the rat was the great feature it had two big round patches of fur like the common or garden rat and one small patch at the nape of its neck and in addition to this it had one large patch of beautiful yellowish fur such as you chiefly see on guinea pigs its tail was pink and long and quite hairless ferrars often kept back good things at meals for it and the bond between them seemed to grow rummer and rummer till he let the rat get on his mind and wilson said he was getting dotty about it which i think was true for one day going into the classroom to get a knife from my desk i saw ferrars with his rat out talking to it he was swatting like anything in play hours for a special old testament history prize and he had the rat and the bible and various books of reference all before him then not knowing i was there he spoke i must win it main reed stick to me this time old chap and see me through he called his rat main reed because that was his favorite author and main reed seemed to understand and he turned his pink eyes on to the open bible and walked over it finding he'd walked over the ninth chapter of the second book of kings ferrars got excited and seeing me said by jove then i'll learn that chapter by heart though it is so long it's good exciting stuff anyway and i bet my rat walking over it means that there'll be a question about jehu and jezebel you'll go cracked about that rat i said it's part of my life he answered i know it seems very peculiar and so it is and i don't suppose such a thing ever happened before but something tells me my prosperity and success is all bound up in that rat he's a familiar spirit in fact like saul had 
if he died i should never do much more good and very likely stick in this class for the rest of my days you'd better not think like that i said because rats are short-lived things owing to the nasty food they eat not that maine reed has nasty food but all pink-eyed animals are delicate and you'll have to lose him sooner or later ferrars didn't take warning by me but after he really did win the old testament prize and there really was a question about jezebel he made a sort of idol out of the rat and some chaps declared he said his prayers to it i know he constantly bought it coconut chips which it was very fond of he trained it too to live in his breast pocket and i often saw him glancing down in class just to get a glimpse of its little eyes looking up at him that taking the piebald rat into class shows the lengths ferrars ran the whole thing was very peculiar some chaps said there was a strong likeness growing up between ferrars and the rat and certainly his thin white face had a rattish look sometimes other fellows told him his rat was an evil spirit and would end by doing him a bad turn but ferrars turned upon them and jawed them with such frightful language that they never said it again meanwhile the doctor went on taking to ferrars more and more and there seemed every chance of his getting the whole bible by heart before he left merivale then came the end of the affair like this ferrars was so dependent on his rat now that he wouldn't do a lesson without it and he lugged it fearlessly into the doctor's study at those times fortunately rare when the doctor took our class himself in scripture but ferrars was such a flyer that we all got tarred with the same brush and the doctor after questioning ferrars for half an hour about bible people we'd never even heard of and getting a string of dead right answers out of him would dismiss us all in great good temper forgetting that he'd only been having a go at one chap a day came when the doctor left us for five minutes in the middle of the class and while most of us had a hurried dip into the plagues of egypt which was the business in hand ferrars who knew as much about the plagues as ever moses did just got out his rat and gave it a bit of almond and a short breather of a yard or so along the floor but the doctor coming back suddenly he had only just time to pop it into his pocket and even then he put the rat into an unusual pocket which it was not accustomed to and didn't like namely a trouser pocket ferrars also shoved a handkerchief down in the pocket to steady the rat then i saw an awful rum expression come over him and he grabbed at the pocket and his mouth fell open and his face got the colour of new putty at the same time i saw his eyes turn to a big bookshelf with glass doors against the side of the room what's the matter ferrars said the doctor you appear unwell oh nothing sir uh, merely a little passing sickness i think then withdraw my boy and ask the matron to give you a few drops of brandy and water you need not dine to-day said the doctor very kindly but ferrars wouldn't withdraw he knew main reed had got through his pocket and down his trouser leg he also knew it was now behind the bookshelf and might reappear at any moment so he said he was better and actually that it would be a grief to him to miss one of the doctor's own lessons but afterwards when the rat didn't come out and the class was dismissed ferrars was frightful to see his hair all got on end somehow and his eyes swelled and stuck out of his head like glass beads and his cheeks got hollow he ran awful risk going into the doctor's study that day but the rat wouldn't come out and ferrars looked old enough to be a master when he went to bed though only eleven and a half really one of two things has happened he said to me for we were in the same dormitory either it's got wedged in behind the bookshelf and will die if not let out or else there was a rat hole there and it went down and has joined common rats and become a sort of king rat among them or been killed i said no they would not kill it he answered anyway to-morrow after the doctor's class is over and everybody is gone i shall stop and make a clean breast of it and ask him for the sake of humanity to have the bookshelf moved but it's all up with me if the rat has lost its feeling towards me and won't come back only if it was stuck and couldn't come back that's different he didn't sleep much that night but he said some prayers which was a thing he didn't often do and of course he was praying that the piebald rat might be allowed to return 
but next day after the scripture class in which ferrars was not nearly so much to the front as usual and got regularly muddled over a potty question about jacob the doctor saved him the trouble of asking about his rat he uh, the doctor i mean had been jolly glum all through class and when it was ended he did a rum thing which was awful to see knowing all we did he told us to keep our places then went to the fireplace and picked up the shovel from the face of it he removed a bit of newspaper and under the newspaper was main reed his pink eyes had gone foggy and there was a little streak of blood on his mouth otherwise his body looked all right now here said the doctor in an awfully solemn way we have a dead piebald rat there can be no outlet for error concerning such a rat as this to have seen such a rat is to remember it already three classes have been before me to-day but nobody knew anything about this animal that it was a tame rat its fatness and sleekness testify moreover the piebald rat is an outcome of artificiality a wild rat in a state of nature is brown or black as the case may be this rat then had an owner and that owner brought it into my study my study and suffered it to escape there that i do well to be angry you will the more easily understand when i tell you that the unsavoury creature was upon my desk last night and has scratched and even eaten some papers whereon were notes for my next sermon it was discovered this morning by one of the domestics she seeing some object moving upon my desk struck with the broom handle and destroyed this rat now let there be no prevarication or evasion of the question i am going to put to you first i wish to know if this rat belongs or rather belonged to any among you and secondly i desire to learn whether supposing the rat be not the property of any present you happen to know whose property it is or rather was i stole a look at ferrars and he appeared so frightful to see that for some reason i thought i'd try and help him so like a fool i was just going to speak when young corky minimus did he said please sir it might be a foreign sort of a rat that came over in that box of pineapples and things that ashby major had sent him from the west indies when i desire your aid in the elucidation of this problem i will apply for it corky minimus answered the doctor so corky dried up then in a sort of voice that was strange to us and seemed to come from his stomach or somewhere new ferrar spoke and i never saw a chap look so ghastly his eyes were fixed on the rat and he came forward slowly please sir it was my rat he said yours ferrars you to disobey you of all boys to set my orders at defiance well, it wasn't an ordinary rat sir i can see what sort of rat it was sir for myself thundered the doctor this it is to consider a boy to devote thought to him to particularly commend him for his theological knowledge i don't take any credit for knowing anything now sir it was the rat as much as me robert ferrars said the doctor in his caning voice you are now adding wicked buffoonery to an act in itself sufficiently disreputable i can't explain sir i don't mean any buffoonery that rat was more to me than you'd think it it did help me somehow and now it's dead it wouldn't be sportsmanlike to it to say not and if you'll let me b -b bury it properly i'll be very thankful to you the doctor looked at ferrars awfully close during this speech either you are lying he said or you suffer from some hysterical and neurotic condition robert ferrars which i have neither suspected nor discovered until this moment then he told us to go but ferrars he kept for half an hour and when ferrars came in to dinner i saw he'd been blubbing he explained to me after we'd gone to bed he said no he didn't cane me or anything he just talked and told me a lot about several things i didn't know and said that familiar spirits were specially barred in the bible i never thought he'd have even tried to understand me but he did and he quite saw my sight about the rat he said kind words over it too and was sorry it was dead and i've got to see dr barnes to-morrow too though of course it's only having my rat on my mind that's upset me and he let me have it to b -b bury gladly where shall you arrange the rat i said 
i'm sending it home in a strays box that jane gave me i've written to my sister where to bury it jane it was who killed it she cried like anything when i told her what mayne reed was to me but he's in the book post by now beautifully done up in shavings and fresh geranium leaves it's no good talking any more only i will say that if he was a familiar spirit he was a jolly good one very different to the sort barred in the scriptures i don't know how i'll get on in the exams now i wish i was dead too then he sniffed a bit and went to sleep End of story five. Story six of the Human Boy by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story six. Brown Bradwell and me. There's more stuff talked about fagging at school than anything else in the world, as far as I can see. And being the smallest boy, but two at Dunstan's and a fag myself i ought to know of course fags do get it pretty hot sometimes if they happen to fag for a beast but big fellows aren't beasts to small ones as a general thing i'm sure bradwell was the best chap that ever came to dunstan's and when he was expelled over the siege in the wing dormitory him and trelawney i felt frightful i'm watson minor myself my brother being watson major one of the reserves for the second eleven and captain of the third the thing i'm going to write out happened just before the siege and was all over before that and it shows what a fag can do it also shows what a jolly good thing it is for big fellows to treat fags well and give them odds and ends so as to get their affection if i hadn't felt what i did to bradwell i shouldn't have run the awful risks i did for him what i did certainly ruined a great project of bradwell's and upset him a good bit at the time but he said afterwards when the blow had fallen and when he could look back and think of it without smacking my head that i had meant well i remember his very words for that matter he said your intentions were all right i will say that but you've ruined my life no chap could say fairer than that and mind you i did ruin his life in a way i've heard many fellows say bradwell was a bounder by birth but he never was to me well bradwell had a great admiration for mabel dunstan the doctor's youngest daughter but one and she had an equal great admiration for him for two terms bradwell although a great sportsman in other ways was fond of girls if he passed a school of them he would look awfully rum and reddish in the face and watery in the eyes once going with him to the playing field for a football match he made the distance half a mile longer by going up a side street to avoid the high school girls and i asked him why and he said it was cheek but told me all the same he said you can't meet women got up like this bradwell has frightfully thin calves to his legs when seen in knickers though he is the best goalkeeper that was ever known at dunstan's of course his affair with mabel dunstan would never have got to be known by me but for my great use to bradwell in carrying notes being in the doctor's house that term i was easily able to do this and there was a jar of green stuff in the hall where she told me to leave the notes which i did she was fifteen i believe or else sixteen but well on in years anyway and a few months older than bradwell it was his general brilliance won her for he could do anything and his father had plenty of money being a man like whiteley's in london only in the north of england bradwell drew almost as well as pictures in books and he used to illustrate the latin grammar for his special chums there's a part of the latin grammar called syntax which i haven't come to yet myself but it has rather rummy things in it with both the latin and english of them and bradwell used to illustrate these things and he illustrated too in my grammar out of pure kindness to me one was balbus is crowning the boy's head with a garland and the other was a snake appeared to sulla while sacrificing and you never saw anything better they were done on the margin in ink and the snake appearing to sulla was about the queerest and best thing ever seen in a latin grammar i have to tell you this because such a lot happened owing to it now brown took my class which is the lowest in the school and i am seventh in it and i gradually got to hate brown because bradwell did and for other reasons of my own too 
brown was said to be only twenty-two and he looked younger than many of the chaps his moustache being whitish and invisible to the eye he wore neckties which i remember hearing mathers say were an insult to nature and would have made a rainbow curl up and faint we always noticed at arithmetic times that brown if he got a stumper would put up the lid of his private desk and hide behind it of course looking the thing up in his crib then he would wander round as if by accident to the chap and do the sum off quick while he remembered it bradwell always hated him and when he found that brown was very friendly with mabel and mabel was very friendly with brown he hated him far far worse bradwell and this girl had a row in the shrubbery at the back of the chapel and i being in the gardener's potting shed at the time feeding a caterpillar of mine heard it bradwell said i'm not blind mabel i've seen it going on ever since last term you read his beastly books and leave rosebuds with scented verbena leaves around them in that stone urn at the gate when he comes down from his house to class and she said and why shouldn't i you must remember please that i am my own mistress besides the intelligence of a grown-up man is very refreshing for some reason bradwell didn't like this his voice squeaked up into his head in a rather rum way when he answered do you call him a man he hasn't got a muscle on him and he doesn't know more than enough to teach the kids that's merely mean jealousy said mabel of course he doesn't talk to you or show you what is in him but he tells me all about his secret life and very beautiful it is he is a genius in fact if it comes to that what can he do said bradwell awfully cleverly can he draw no he doesn't draw oh can he sing no can he play the piano no now all of these things bradwell could do to perfection so he got cheerfuller and cheerfuller what can he do then besides jaw the kids and always sneak to the doctor i never saw such jealousy as this said mabel but if you must know i'll tell you what he can do he can write poetry out of his own head and he has got a solid book of it ready to print some day there i suppose bradwell couldn't write poetry anyway he got very down in the face at this he didn't say anything appearing to be frightfully shocked at what he'd heard then mabel said when you can quote browning and byron and shelley and write poems yourself it will be soon enough to sneer at mr brown you love him said bradwell in a very tragic voice i don't love anybody but my own family said mabel but i admire him and i admire his poetry which is very much out of the common indeed it's all over then i suppose said bradwell i don't know what you mean she replied to him a thing that has never begun can't be all over which words of mabel's seem to knock the heart out of bradwell then the gardener came along and i didn't hear anything else of course i couldn't help hearing what i had done though i tried hard not to and kept feeding my caterpillar like anything all the time two days after i had to carry another note to mabel i found one waiting for bradwell in the usual place so they must have made it up then came the beginning of my misfortunes with brown he found the snake appearing to sulla in my latin grammar and called me up and said he knew very well i hadn't drawn it myself but wanted to know who had he said it was wrong to the doctor to ruin our books and that he had seen in several different books the same snake evidently done by the same boy owing to them being so much similar but the very identical thing had happened in another class to steggles bradwell having drawn him the same picture and knowing what steggles said being a chap who is frightfully cunning i said the same now to brown i said i left the book on my desk and somebody came along and done it while i was out of the room brown seemed inclined not to believe this anyway he took the latin grammar away with him but i heard no more about it till the next evening when i wanted the book in prep remembering brown had it i went off to his study and knocked and walked in brown wasn't there for the moment and the room was empty i took the opportunity to look at a rather beautiful tobacco jar of brown's which i have seen at a distance on his mantelpiece many times passing his table to get to it i chanced to glance there and judge of my surprise when the first words i saw at the top of a big sheet of paper were to mabel 
underneath was a lot of writing and the whole table seemed to be littered with paper covered with small bits of separate writing much of it scratched out and done over again but the piece with to mabel at the top was all beautiful and clean without anything scratched being i suppose the result of all the other bits put together and neatly copied out well there i was with my duty towards bradwell as his fag brown had evidently done a verse out of his own head for mabel dunstan and had written it in this beautiful style on thick white paper to send to her i felt if she got it knowing what she'd said to bradwell about brown that it was certain she would abandon bradwell him not being any good at poems i wouldn't have done it for anybody else in the world but bradwell i wouldn't have done it at all if i had known what the end of it was going to be but anyway at the time it seemed to me as bradwell's fag i ought to do it and so i did i took the poem and rolled it up so as not to hurt it and hooked off to bradwell he was in his study and trelawney who shares it with him being out of the room i was able to explain i said if you please bradwell i've come from mr brown's study and he was not there and happening by a curious accident to glance on the table i saw this and knowing about you and mabel and being your fag i took it took what said bradwell i put the thing in front of him and he got red and excited it's a poem to mabel by that beast brown he said then he read it out half to himself but i heard the thing ran like this to mabel oh let my muse sing to the name of mabel whose azure eyes are fastened to my soul like to forget-me-nots in buttonhole to tell of my heart's torment i'm unable my thoughts they spin my brain it grows unstable when fixed on thee perchance it is my role never to reach my mad ambition's goal but to live ere midst scholastic babble thy glances brighten all my lonely lot prometheus like a vulture gnaws my heart in biting blasts and under sunshine hot my dreams are shattered by a barbed dart and walking wild i scream that i may not whisper the oaths i yearn to thee impart i told bradwell i didn't quite understand it and he sat on me you wouldn't he said a kid like you but i do it's a sonnet and an extremely fine one i hate the chap but it's no good pretending he's not a poet because this jolly well proves he is look at the rhymes and the smoothness it seems a heroic thing of bradwell to say that feeling as he did to brown he thought for a bit but told me not to go of course he said this must be returned all's fair in a case of this kind but then he thought very deeply and read the sonnet again suddenly he took a bit of paper and copied down brown's poem word for word then he told me to cut back like lightning to brown's study and to put the poem back on his desk if i could if not to most carefully keep it till the first chance of getting it back to brown's room without being spotted you're a splendid fag he said and i shan't forget this it's the sort of thing that squires did for their knights in olden times and they got good rewards too now hook it it's worth a lot mind you to get praise like that from such a chap as bradwell when i got back brown was rummaging over his table and swearing a good deal in a loud whisper he told me to wait a minute and went off to look in his bedroom then i seized my opportunity and slipped the sonnet on his table under some papers when he came back he was worried and went on hunting till he found it then he said ah to himself and got pleasanter and asked me what i wanted i told him my latin grammar and being in a very happy state now owing to finding the poem he gave my book back and told me to clear out which i did after prep i met bradwell going into prayers and he handed me a note for mabel to put in the usual place he looked awfully rum when he gave it to me and he saw that i saw he looked rum so he said i don't mind letting you know owing to your being such a good fag and my trusting you as i do you may read the letter in prayers then seal it down and put it behind the pot of ferns in the hall in the usual place of course it wasn't really a letter or bradwell wouldn't have let me read it it was just brown's sonnet copied out by bradwell word for word and at the bottom where the words what about poetry now a t b 
a t b are bradwell's initials his full name being arthur thomas bradwell you see he didn't exactly say he'd written the sonnet he only said what about poetry now the excitement of it all kept me awake for hours and hours through the night i don't suppose any fag ever did more for a big fellow than i had done for bradwell that day then i began to wonder when brown would send off his poem and whether mabel would get them both together or one at a time you see of course brown would send her the thing as original and there was nothing in bradwell's letter to exactly say he hadn't written it and puzzling the thing out for hours and hours i at last came to the conclusion that she would find it very difficult which to believe because how could she know which was telling the truth to her then about three or four in the morning almost i began to feel rather terrible over it because i thought of what frightful trouble brown must have had to write the sonnet he might have taken terms and terms over it for all i could tell not of course knowing myself how long it took to write poetry i felt rather sorry for brown but after all a chap's duty is to the fella he fags for before masters and feeling that i went to sleep three days later bradwell had me in his room and told me the end of it all which shows that a girl never does what you might expect as a lesson to you young watson said bradwell i may tell you that my career has been utterly blighted and my life ruined by that business of the sonnet i said i was sorry to hear it he said yes blighted and so's his i mean brown's she got my letter that night and his next morning that night she felt all her old feeling for me return because of the sonnet thinking i'd done it then next morning she got just the very same stuff to a word from brown with a letter saying he had burned the midnight oil to compose it well there you are what does she do instead of accepting my statement being the first she argues in a most elaborate way that i couldn't possibly have copied from brown and brown couldn't possibly have copied from me but it would have been too much of a coincidence if we'd both written exactly the same sonnet out of our own heads so what does she conclude i said i didn't know why fat head that we both copied it from somebody else out of some book by some well-known proper dead poet i've no doubt now on thinking over it that brown did do that because when i first read his poem i could hardly believe that he had written such real poetry owing to the rhymes and smoothness but it's all over now she's written a letter i can't show you to hope even for her friendship wouldn't be any good a girl hates a joke something frightful how about brown i said she's written to him also asking him where he got the verses out of and explaining she doesn't believe they are original and saying how another acquaintance of hers had sent the very same lot the day before so now you see what a sinful mess you've made of it i said i did but i felt it was my duty to him yes i know he said but the question is what do i do now you see all's fair and all that but now being out of the hunt ought i to throw up the sponge and tell the truth or ought i not i don't know bradwell i said but anyway you won't mention me i hope because i only acted for you and did a jolly dangerous thing no you're safe enough and in fact i'm going to reward you for what you did do said bradwell but seeing i'm out of it i think it will be a manly act to brown if i tell mabel frankly that i resorted to strategy but me i said i shall merely inform her answered bradwell that one of my emissaries found the poem and of course brought it to me that i dispatched it as a joke taking care not to say i was the author i shall end with these words brown is innocent all of which he did and i left the letter in the usual spot but mabel cut him altogether from that day and he told me girls have no humour and laughed it off though he felt it a lot and often smacked my head out of bitterness of mind afterwards but not hard he gave me an old knife for a reward but told me at the same time never to do anything for him again without being commanded as for mabel she threw over brown just like she threw over bradwell in spite of bradwell's letter and bradwell said it was a nemesis whatever that is and i had a nemesis too because a week afterwards bradwell threw over me and made young west his fag i felt hurt but of course that didn't get known to bradwell and if i fag again i won't so much as make a piece of toast unless i'm commanded to 
End of story six. Story seven of The Human Boy by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven Gideon's Front Tooth. I believe Gideon was the only Jew that ever came to Dunstan's, and I expect, taking it all round, he might have had a better time at a school for Jews in general, though in one way he wouldn't have done as well, and wouldn't have had the adventure with old Grimble, which turned out so splendidly for him when old Grimble died. Though easily the richest chap at Merivale, and getting no less than ten shillings a week pocket money, Gideon was so awfully fond of coin that he hardly spent a penny, and the only thing he did with his money was to lend it to fellows. He didn't lend it for nothing, having a curious system by which you paid in marbles or bats or knives for the money, and in spite of that still had to pay back the money itself after a certain time. You signed a paper, and Gideon said that if chaps hadn't paid back the tin on the dates named, it would be very serious for them. But it got serious for him after a bit, because Steggles, who knew quite as much about money as Gideon, though he never had any, borrowed a whole pound once, and promised to pay five shillings for it for one term. And Gideon was new to Steggles then, and agreed. But when the time of payment came, Steggles said that Gideon had better regard it as a bad debt, because he wasn't going to pay back even the original pound then gideon thought a bit and asked him why and steggles told him he said because you know jolly well the doctor doesn't allow chaps to lend money and gideon said this is the first time i've heard that anyway it's usury which is a crime said steggles and i'm not going to pay anything and being less than twenty-one you can't make me so it amounts to a bad debt as i told you just now you've done jolly well one way and another and you've got two bats and lord knows how many india-rubber balls and cricket balls and silver pencils and knives out of it including ashby miner's watch-chain which is silver and if you take my tip you'll keep quiet because once all these kids get to know anybody under twenty-one can borrow money without returning it then it's all up with your beastly financial schemes gideon was remarkably surprised to know what a lot steggles had found out about him and accused him of looking into his play-chest and steggles said he had then gideon went and about three chaps who had heard the talk told others and they told still more chaps until finally a good many fellows who owed gideon money felt there was no hurry about paying it back till it happened to be convenient in fact gideon jolly soon saw he couldn't do any more good for himself like that and at the beginning of the next term when chaps were pretty flush of coin he wrote up in the gym there will be a sale of bats knives and other various useful articles between two and three o'clock by auction on tuesday j gideon somebody tore it down but not before most fellows had read it and when gideon and young miller who had a bat in the auction and hoped to get it back if possible were seen carrying gideon's play chest to the gym after dinner on the appointed day of course we went it passed off very well for gideon because the things were really good and often almost new he seemed to know all about auctions and hit the chest with a stump and explained the things and what good points they had about them he only took money down and i will say nobody could have done it fairer if a knife had a broken blade for instance or a bat was slightly sprung which happened with one he always pointed it out so that nobody could say he had been choused over it young miller got back his bat for four shillings and eight pence and ashby minor got back his silver chain for thirteen shillings but it wasn't much good to him because in order to raise the thirteen bob he had to raffle the chain at once at shilling shares and he took one hoping to be lucky but he wasn't foul unfortunately getting it gideon told me afterwards that the sale came out fairly but not quite what he had hoped he rather sneered at the dunstan chaps in general and said they were a poverty-stricken crew which got me into a bait and i told him that i'd sooner be the son of an officer in the royal navy which i am than the biggest jew diamond dealer in the world his father being in that profession he said there was no accounting for taste but he would have thought that a man who could deliberately go and be a sailor must be weak in the head 
then i punched him and he instantly went down and apologized i may mention that i am bray the cock of the lower school before coming to gideon's front tooth just to let you know exactly the chap he was i'll mention another thing he did an old woman was allowed to bring up fruit and tuck generally and sell it to us after morning school steggles who knows the reason for pretty nearly everything said this was permitted by dr dunston to take the edge off our appetites but anyway the old woman sold strawberries and raspberries in summer time and these were arranged with cabbage leaves in little wicker baskets at about four pence each well one day gideon who never refused to eat fruit if offered it but very seldom bought any asked the old woman what she gave for the wicker baskets and she said three pence a dozen then he asked her what she would give for those which had been used once and she thought and said they would be worth at least three half pence a dozen to her he didn't say any more but after that it was a rum thing how all the used baskets which generally were seen kicking about the playground in shoals disappeared nobody noticed it at the time but afterwards we remembered clearly that they had disappeared and just at the end of the term a chap hurrying in late after the bell rang came bang on gideon and the old woman round a corner out of sight of the gates and the chap saw gideon give her a pile of baskets and get three halfpence of course it was the last three halfpence he ever got that way because when it became known the chaps rendered their baskets useless for commerce in many ways and barlow called gideon shylock minor when he heard that he'd made two shillings and five pence halfpenny which name stuck to gideon forever and steggles got nine other chaps to subscribe a penny each and buy a pound of flesh from a butcher's shop because in shakespeare shylock was death on his pound of flesh the pound was put under gideon's pillow by steggles himself and when gideon shoved his watch under his pillow which he always did at night he found it and steggles says he turned pale but read what was pinned on the pound of flesh and then smiled and wrapped the meat up in a letter from home and said what fools you chaps are wasting money like that but it looks all right and will mean a good feed for nothing next day he got up very early and took his pound of flesh down to the kitchen and got them to cook it and he ate about half before breakfast and had the rest cold in his desk during monsieur michel's lesson which was a safe time and steggles said we ought to have gone one better and put poison on it the great affair of the tooth came on at the beginning of next term and first i must tell you that next door to dunston's lived an old man so frightfully ancient that his skin was all shrivelled over his bones he didn't like boys much but he would look over his garden wall sometimes into our playground and scowl if anybody caught his eye various things of course went over the wall often and it was one of the excitements of dunston's to go into old grimble's yard and get them back twice only he caught a chap and both times despite his awful age and yellowness of skin he thrashed the chap very fairly hard with a walking stick but he never reported anybody to dunston and it was generally thought he regarded it as a sort of sport hunting for chaps in his garden of course in fair open hunting he hadn't a chance and the two he did catch he caught by stealth hiding behind bushes in a rather dark evening well the facts would never have been known about this tooth but for gideon's mean spirit it happened to be necessary for him to fight me and though not caring much about it he couldn't help himself besides though the champion of the lower school i was tons smaller than gideon and gideon didn't know till after the fight that i was a champion the true facts about my greatness being hid from him just before the fight gideon said oh my tooth by the way it may hurt and it cost my father five guineas so to our great interest he unscrewed one of his two top front teeth and gave it to his second you couldn't have told it was a sham so remarkably was it done and it screwed on to the foundation of the original tooth much like a spike screws into the sole of a cricket boot 
gideon had fallen downstairs when he was ten and knocked off half the tooth so he told us but murray who is well up in science said that all jews front teeth are rather rocky because in feudal times they were pulled out with pincers as a form of torture and to make the jews give up their secret treasures murray said that after many generations of pulling out nature got sick of it and that in modern times the front teeth of jews aren't worth talking about murray is full of rum ideas like that and he hopes to go in for engineering having already many secret inventions waiting to be patented as to gideon i licked him rather badly in two rounds and a half then he was mopped up and dressed and screwed in his front tooth again with the greatest ease once it got known about this tooth and fellows were naturally excited steggall said it was on the principle of a tobacco pipe mouthpiece and finding the chaps were keen to see it gideon let it be generally known he would freely show it to anybody for three pence a time and to friends for two pence but this was a safe reduction to make because properly speaking he hadn't any friends seeing there were nearly two hundred boys at dunston's and that certainly half including several boys from the sixth took a pleasure in seeing the tooth and didn't mind the rather high charge gideon did jolly well and in the case of nubby tomkins he made actually one shilling and threepence because the tooth had a most peculiar fascination for nubby and he saw it no less than five times after that gideon made a reduction to him as well he might but somehow slade the head of the school was very averse to gideon's front tooth when he heard about it and he decided that there must be no more exhibition of it for money he told gideon so himself however a new boy came a week afterwards and heard about the strangeness of the tooth and offered a shilling in three installments to see it which was too much temptation for gideon and he showed it contrary to what slade had said slade of course heard for the new boy happened to be his own cousin though called saunders and then there was a curious scene in the playground which i fortunately saw slade came up to gideon in the very quiet way he has and asked him in a perfectly gentlemanly voice for his front tooth at first gideon seemed inclined not to give it up but he saw what an awfully serious thing that would be and finally unscrewed it though not willingly now said slade i'll have no more of this penny peep show business at merivale i told you once and you have disobeyed me so there's an end of your beastly tooth what's this he took something out of his pocket it's a catapult said gideon it is said slade and i'm going to use your tooth instead of a bullet and fire it into space it cost five guineas said gideon don't care if it cost a hundred answered slade still in a very gentlemanly sort of way we can't have this sort of thing here you know slade was just going to fire into space as he had said when a robin suddenly settled within thirty yards of us on the wall between the playground and old grimble's slade being a wonderful shot with a catapult having once shot a wood pigeon suddenly fired at the robin and only missed it by about four inches he said the shape of a front tooth was very unfavorable for shooting but anyway the tooth went over into grimble's and we distinctly heard it hit against the side of his house then slade went away and we rotted gideon rather because not having the tooth looked rum and made a difference in his voice he took it very quietly and said he rather thought his father would be able to summon slade and before evening school having marked down the spot where he fancied his tooth had hit grimble's house he went to look with a box of matches what happened afterwards he told us frankly and it was certainly true because with all his faults gideon never lied to anybody i went quietly over and began carefully looking along the bottom of the wall using a match to every foot or so he said and i had done about half when i heard a door open i then hooked it and ran almost on to old grimble he had not opened the door at all but was coming up the garden path at the critical moment of course he caught me he was going to rub it into me with his stick when i said i should think it very kind if he would hear me first as i had a perfectly good excuse for being there he said what excuse can you have for trespassing in my garden you little oily wretch 
oily wretch was what he called me and i said that my tooth had been fired into his garden that very day and about half past one by a chap with a catapult and i lighted a match and showed him it was missing he said how the deuce are you going to find a tooth in a garden this size and i told him i had marked it down very carefully and that it had cost five guineas and that i rather believed my father would be able to summon the chap who had shot it away he seemed a good deal interested and said he thought very likely he might if it was robbery with violence then he asked me if i was the boy he had seen beating down the price of a purse at wilkinson's in maryvale and i said i was then he said come in and have a bit of cake boy and i went in and had a bit of cake and saw on a shelf in his room about fifty or sixty cricket balls and various things which he had collared when they went over he asked me a lot of questions about different things and i answered them all he said was about money he also asked me to be good enough to value the things he had which came over the wall from time to time and i did and he thanked me they were worth fifteen shillings and tenpence and wright's ball which everybody thought was stolen by the milkman wasn't for old grimble had it and the milkman should be told and apologized to well he knew a lot about money and he told me he had thousands of gold sovereigns which he makes breed into thousands more he said you're the only boy i ever met with a grain of sense in his head now if i gave you a check on my bankers in merivale for five pounds to-day and wrote to you to-morrow morning to say i had changed my mind what would you do i said it would be too late sir because your check would have been sent off to my father that very night to put out at interest for me he said that's right never give back money or anything then he asked me my name and told me i might come back to-morrow and look for my tooth by daylight that was gideon's most peculiar adventure and though he never found the tooth or saw old grimble again yet about seven or eight months afterwards when old grimble was discovered all curiously twisted up and dead in bed by the man who took him his breakfast the result of gideon's visit to him came out old grimble had specially put him into his will by some legal method and dr dunstan had gideon into his study three days after old grimble kicked it then was proved that old grimble had left gideon all the things that came over the wall and also a legacy of fifty pounds in money because according to the bit of the will which the father read to gideon out of a lawyer's letter he was the only boy old grimble had ever met with who showed any intelligence above that of the anthropoid ape gideon returned all the balls and things to their owners free of charge but not until the rightful owners proved they were so and the money he sent to his father and his father he told me afterwards was so jolly pleased about the whole affair that he added nine hundred and fifty pounds to old grimble's fifty therefore by shooting gideon's front tooth at a robin slade was actually putting the enormous sum of one thousand pounds into gideon's pocket which i should think was about the rummest thing that ever happened in the world gideon stopped at dunstan's one term after that then he went away and i believe began to help his father to sell diamonds he was fairly good at french and very at german but of other things he knew rather little except arithmetic and his was the most beautiful arithmetic which had ever been done at maryvale for i heard stokes who was a seventeenth wrangler in his time tell the doctor so End of story seven. Story eight of the Human Boy by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story eight: The Chemistry Class. This story about Guy Fawkes' night at Dunstan's is worth knowing because it shows the rumminess of Nubby Tompkins. Tompkins, I may say, was called Nubby owing to his nose, which was extremely huge, though he said it was Roman and swore he wouldn't change it if he could anyway bradwell made a rhyme about it that is certainly good enough to repeat he wrote it first on a blackboard with chalk and a good many chaps learned it by heart it ran like this our nubby's nose is ponderous and our nubby's nose is long so it wouldn't disgrace our nubby's face if half his nose was gone 
which was not only jolly good poetry but also true a thing all poetry isn't by long chalks as you can see in virgil and such like well nubbs sang the solos in chapel on sundays and people came from far to hear him do it in consequence of which so steggles said the doctor favoured him and regarded him as an advertisement to dunstan's but his singing wasn't in it compared with the advertisement he gave the doctor on guy fawkes night the term before slade left to explain the whole tremendous thing i must tell you that nubbs belonged to the chemistry class this class in fact was pretty well started for him his father telling dunstan so nubbs said that he shouldn't send him at all if he couldn't be taught chemistry because nubbs had shown a good deal of keenness for chemicals generally from the earliest days and bought little boxes of serpents eggs and red fire instead of sweets ever since he was old enough to buy anything he had also blown off his eyebrows and eyelashes with a mixture he was grinding up in a mortar and they had never grown again to this day all of which things showed he had chemistry in him to a great extent so the doctor started a chemistry class and a chap called stoddard from maryville came up once a week to take it and nubbs joined and so did i not because i had chemistry in me worth speaking of but because i was a chum of nubby's wilson also joined and so did hodges i may mention my name is mathers i always thought that chemists simply mix the muck doctors give you when you're queer but it seems not in fact there are several sorts of chemists and nub said he hoped to belong to the best sort who don't have bottles of red and green stuff in the windows and so on he said a man who sold pills and toothbrushes and licorice root and soap could not be considered a classy chemist the real flyers made discoveries and froze air and sneaked one another's inventions and got knighted by the queen if they had luck and if they were well thought of by the newspapers i should think really nubbs might come to being knighted if he sticks to it for even down to the stuff in cough lozenges nothing is hid from him once the matron gave me simply a vile lozenge for my throat which got a bit foggy owing to falling into the water during hare and hounds well the lozenge was white in colour but even a white lozenge may be very decent sometimes so i took a shot at it going to bed but it was so jolly frightful to the taste that i chucked it away and next morning found it again and examined it after drying on it i then found the words chlorate of potash so i took it to nubbs he said it was certainly a chemical and added that the stuff in it was almost the same as you make pharaoh's serpents with i could hardly believe such a thing so he lighted the lozenge and it burned blue and a long wriggling brownish ash came curling out of it like a snake just as nubby said which is well worth knowing to anybody who ever has a chlorate of potash lozenge many such like remarkable and useful things nubby could tell you among others how to mix sulphur and gunpowder and other ingredients for fireworks he had in fact an awful fine book devoted to the subject and wooden affairs to load cases and once when stoddart didn't turn up and the doctor put us on our honour to do the proper things in the laboratory alone nubbs finished off analysing some mess in about five minutes and spent the complete rest of the time making a rocket it had four blue stars and thirteen yellow ones and the case was made out of a stiff brown paper roll in which his mother had that morning sent nubbs a photograph of her new baby at home and nubbs forgot the photograph and stuffed the mixture in upon it and made a separate compartment for the stars on top so the photograph of nubby's mother's new baby curiously enough went off with the rocket and was never more seen by mortal eye not that nubbs cared he kept the rocket till the doctor's birthday and after prayers when he knew he was in his study with the windows open and the blinds up being summer-time nubbs let it off in the front garden and we helped it turned out very good in a way though not quite a perfect rocket because instead of going up it tore along the ground but it tore for an enormous distance and then turned and came back all of itself and the blue stars did not go off but the yellow ones did or some in a bed of rather swagger geraniums unfortunately the doctor didn't care much about it not understanding our motives but nubbs explained that he had done it out of honour to the day 
then the doctor thanked him and said he had doubtless meant well and that from the earliest times of the chinese the pyrotechnist art had been employed upon occasions of legitimate festivity and rejoicing i mention this because it was the encouragement he had over this creeping rocket that made nubbs get so above himself if you understand me he never forgot it and next autumn term he actually asked the doctor if he might have a regular firework display in the playground on the night of the fifth of november he asked rather cunningly just after an english history lesson during which the doctor had been slating guy fox frightfully and having said such a heap of hard things about the beggar dr dunstan couldn't very well refuse he said your request is unusual tompkins but i can see no objection at the moment however i will let you have my answer at no distant date and i said to nubbs that means he'll think and think till he's got a reason why you shouldn't and let you know then but nubbs said to me i believe he'll let me do it feeling so jolly bitter as he does about guy fox and blessed if he didn't nubbs undertook to make the things himself nothing was to be bought but chemicals in a raw unmixed condition and dr dunstan actually headed the subscription list with two shillings sixpence and thompson gave the same and mannering two shillings and frenchy three shillings fifty-two chaps also contributed various sums from one shilling to a penny and nubbs became rather important and went down gradually to the bottom of the lower fifth owing to the strain upon his mind he gathered together two pounds seven shillings five pence in all and made it up to two pounds ten shillings himself and fowle's father who was in some business where they used sulphur in terrific quantities got four pounds weight of it for nothing and nub said it was a godsend for illuminating purposes he had been to the crystal palace and told us he was going to carry everything out just like they did there as far as he could with the money at the last moment he got a tremendous increase of funds in the shape of a pound from his father and strangely enough it was that extra pound that wrecked him without that father's pound he couldn't have arranged the principal feature of the whole performance and without that principal feature nothing in the way of misfortunes to nubs worth mentioning would have fallen out but the pound came and with it a letter very encouraging to nubby he went on mixing away at the various proper compounds and experimenting with them till he got his rockets to go up like larks and his roman candles to shoot out stars the length of a cricket pitch then his governor's pound came and he decided on having a set piece with it a set piece nubby said is the triumph of the firework maker's art and very likely it is in proper hands you can have likenesses in fire or words or ships or fame crowning virtue or in fact pretty well anything a set piece is designed small first then large and it is worked out with little tiny things like squibs only very small and without any bang at the end these are all lighted off at once and they burn one color first then change to another nubbs said his would start yellow because it was cheaper and finally turn green the thing was what design to have and the four chaps in the chemistry class all thought differently i advised trying a shot at a huge portrait of the doctor but when it came to particulars nobody knew how to work a portrait and hodges thought we might do something about guy fox but nubbs didn't care about that then hodges thought again and suggested the words god bless the doctor and i agreed that it would be fine but wilson said it was profane and might annoy the doctor frightfully especially when it turned green then nub suggested the words dr dunstan is a brick and hodges said that it was good and wilson said it might be good but it wasn't true anyway however it was three to one though we all admitted that from his point of view wilson was right to hate the doctor because the doctor hates him the thing was to make a licking big frame of light wood and arrange the letters across it and the note of exclamation at the end this we did and hammered it against the playground wall and wheeled up the screens that go behind the bowler's arm in the cricket season and hid away the set piece behind them till the time came likewise we arranged stakes for the roman candles and a board for the catherine wheels and a string for the flying pigeons and so on 
and also we rigged up bits of tin round the playground and by the fir trees at the top end and behind the gym these were for bengal lights and other illuminations all of this nubs had arranged for the paltry sum of three pounds ten shillings the chemistry class had a half holiday as the time drew on and we worked like niggers all four of us nubs commanded so to speak and mixed and did the grinding and pounding and stars hodges and i hammered up the heavy posts and stakes in the playground and carried out odd jobs generally and wilson manufactured cases for everything with brown paper and paste and string the set piece took two hundred and thirteen little tubes these wilson made in lengths of a yard and cut off at the required size and nubs stuffed them with green fire first and yellow on top it promised to be a jolly big thing altogether and four days before the night nubs began to get awfully nervous and to prepare yards and yards of touch paper and corky minimus heard the doctor say to brown really the lads have devoted no little energy and method on their proceedings and it appears so mr stoddart tells me that the boy tomkins has mixed his compounds quite correctly thereby ensuring that brilliance and variety which is looked for in an exhibition of this kind i wonder whether we might ask the parents and friends of those who dwell at merivale and the immediate neighbourhood and brown who never misses a chance of showing the brute he is at heart said really i should think twice dr dunstan there is such an element of chance with amateur fireworks unfortunately we can't have a dress rehearsal as with the scenes from shakespeare and the recitations at the end of the term nevertheless said the doctor i am disposed to run the risk a little harmless pleasure combined with courtesy to relatives at midterm is rather desirable than not so about fifty people were asked and they brought fifty more and the cads from merivale got to know too and there was a good crowd of them along the fence by the gym also two policemen came and nubs who was nervous before grew much worse when he heard of it besides we had a frightful shock two days before the firework night owing to the loss of poor old wilson by simply sickening luck he got reported by brown for cheek it was when brown came out in a new pair of awfully squeaking boots with sham pearl buttons at the side and drab tops and wilson said they were ugly eighteens and brown heard him the doctor took an awfully grave view of this and told wilson that personality was the vilest kind of cheek which wouldn't have mattered but he gave him a thousand lines as well and forbade him to see the fireworks or help any more with them and that's the man you call a brick wilson said rather bitterly it certainly was rough after the way he had worked but from the wing dormitory where he would be at the time he might be able to see pretty well everything by leaning far out between the window bars which nubs pointed out to him and he said he should he also said he'd pay out brown some day and very likely dunston too well the night came and it was a fine one and the cads likewise came and lined the fence then the doctor clapped his hands twice which was the signal to begin and just as he did so out burst yellow fire everywhere behind the bits of tin lighted simultaneously by seven chaps and everybody seemed to like it and the doctor said capital bravo tomkins a pleasing and fairy-like conceit then nubs let fly two rockets and they went up well and burst out in stars though not as many by any means as we had crammed into them but one twisted for some reason and instead of falling in the direction of the cads the stick twinkled down with just a spark of red here and there in the line of it bang behind the chapel both nubs and i distinctly heard it go smack through the top of the greenhouse and i rather think the doctor heard it too for he didn't say bravo or anything but just sent a kid to tell nubs to point future rockets the other way which disheartened nubs because he's like a girl at times of great excitement such as this was but he soon cheered up especially at the splendid success of the catherine wheels which he hadn't hoped much from 
and at the cheers even the cads gave for the golden rain which showed up everything as bright as day including maud and the other dunston girls and mrs dunston and nubby's father standing smiling very amiably by the doctor and the policeman blinking and the crowd and a white dab hanging out of a high window afar off which i saw and knew to be wilson only the balloon failed owing to the nervousness of nubs who set fire to the whole show while he was trying to light the spirit on the sponge underneath but he passed it off with crackers thrown among the kids and then while they were all yelling he dragged away the cricket screens and nubs let off the set piece he lighted the touch paper and it snapped and crackled all over the design in a moment and a thick smoke arose and out of it came the set piece flaring in rich yellow fire of course we expected what nubs and wilson had arranged viz dr dunston is a brick but instead there came out these awful words dr dunston is a brute that just shows what a frightful difference three letters will make in a thing and the night was so dark and the letters so big that you could have read them a mile off only if you will believe it dunston didn't people applauded like anything at first till the preliminary smoke cleared off and they read the truth then they shut up and made a sound like wind coming through a wood but the cads yelled and roared and so did the policemen for i heard them and to make the frightful thing a shade more frightful if possible the doctor who is blind as ten bats and didn't realize the end of the set piece but only read his name at the top clapped his hands and said famous famous you excel yourself tompkins then the words began gradually to turn green and for that matter so did nubs in fact whether it was the reflected light or the condition of his mind or both i certainly never saw any chap become so perfectly horrid to look at as nubs did then his nose seemed to stand out like a great green rock and his eyes bulged and his chin dropped and the set piece turned his teeth as bright as precious emeralds he just merely said good lord nothing more then hooked it off into the darkness simply shattered at the same time stoddard and thompson and mannering and brown and some chaps from the sixth not knowing what color the beastly set piece might turn next or how soon the doctor would spot it dashed at the thing and dragged it down and trampled on it and brown in the act burned the very boots that wilson had cheeked which pleased wilson a good deal when he heard it after that it was all over and the doctor thinking the set piece had died a natural death so to speak saw me under the gaslight at the gate as everybody streamed out and said ah young man what was that last word in the illumination i know you and hodges also had a hand in it as well as tompkins and i said please sir we arranged the words dr dunston is a brick and he said excellent pithy and concise if a little familiar i only hope you all echo that sentiment every one of you send tompkins to me and tell the other fellows there is cake and lemonade going on in the dining hall just as if the other fellows didn't know it but everybody gave three cheers for the doctor and mrs dunston and i started to find nubs and the policeman made the cads go though they went reluctantly i looked long for nubby and at last found him all alone in the gym one bit of candle was burning which looked frightfully poor after all the brilliance of the fireworks and nubs had got the parallel bars under the flying rings and was standing on them i mean the bars what the dickens are you doing nubby i said and he answered it's no jolly good attempting to stop me now because it's too late my life is ruined and my father was there too to see it ruined and i'm going to hang myself as every convenience for hanging is here mind you he would have done it knowing tompkins as i do and his great ingeniousness i don't mind swearing that he would have been a hung chap in another minute so i told him but though doubtful he decided to put it off anyway i even got him to promise he wouldn't hang himself at all if his father believed his innocence about the set piece and crew the headmaster under the doctor and old briggs and thompson got us in a corner nubs and hodges and me and we solemnly vowed we knew nothing of it 
and crew went down to the merivale trumpet and made the reporter put in the original words when it came out and thompson explained to mrs dunstan how some evil disposed wicked person had tampered with the set-piece and begged her not to wound the feelings of the doctor by telling him and the sixth hushed it up among the kids and i sneaked a bit of cake for wilson and went up after the row was over and told him everything down to the burning of brown's boots he confessed to me then that he had done it which didn't surprise me much knowing how he had worked and then at the last minute almost been deprived of seeing the show it was certainly a terrible revenge but of course a terrible revenge which doesn't come off owing to a master being too short-sighted to see it is pretty sickening for the revenger besides the risk mr crewe worked like a demon to find out who had done it and he suspected wilson from the first but couldn't prove it but at last he did find out through fowl who got it out of ferrars who got it out of west who got it out of nubs in a moment of rage for i may say wilson himself told nubs and nubs never forgave him and says he never shall even if they both go to heaven so crewe having found out had some talk with wilson but he didn't lick him whereas wilson did lick fowl and that pretty badly not that fowl cares for an ordinary licking more than another chap cares for a smack on the head the only way to hurt him is to twist his arm round about twice and then hit him hard just above the elbow i may say i found this out myself and everybody does it now End of story eight. Story nine of the Human Boy by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story nine: Doctor Dunstan's Howler. Mind you, if it's interesting to watch any ordinary person come a howler, what must it be to see your own headmaster do it? A howler, of course, is the same as a cropper, and you can come one at cricket or football, or in class or in everyday life. Doctor Dunstan's Howler was a most complicated sort and i had the luck to be one of the chaps who witnessed him come it of course to see any master make a tremendous mistake is good but when you are dealing with a man almost totally bald and sixty-two years of age the affair has a solemn side especially owing to his being a reverend and a doctor of divinity in fact slade who was with me said the spectacle reminded him of the depths of woe beggars got into in greek tragedies which often wanted half a dozen gods to lug them out of but no gods troubled themselves about dunstan and it really was a bit awkward looked at from his point of view because it's beastly to give yourself away to kids at the best of times and no doubt to him all of us are more or less as kids even the sixth he often had a way of bringing the parents of a possible new boy through one or two of the big classrooms and the chapel of merivale just to show what a swagger place it was then we all bucked up like mad and the masters bucked up too and gave their gowns a hitch round and their mortarboards a cock up and made more noise and put on more side generally just to add to the splendor of the scene from the point of view of the parents of the possible new boy sometimes the affair was rather spoiled by an aunt or mother or some woman or other asking the doctor homely sort of questions about sanitary arrangements or prayers then to see old dunstan making long-winded replies and getting even the drains to sound majestic was fine his manner varied according to the people who came over the school sometimes if it only happened to be a guardian or a lawyer he was short and stern then he just swept along calling attention to the ventilation and discipline and looking at the chaps as if they were dried specimens in a museum but with fathers or women he had a playful mood and an expression known as the errant smile to mothers he never talked about pupils but called the whole shoot of us his lads and beamed and fluttered his gown like a hen with chickens flutters its wings the masters always copied him and to see that little brute brown trying to flutter over the kids like a hen when the doctor came into his classroom was a ghastly sight knowing him as we did 
and also the doctor would often pat a youngster on the head and beam at him he generally singled corky minimus out for patting and beaming and corky minor said the irony of it was pretty frightful considering that corky minimus for different reasons got licked oftener by the doctor than almost any chap in the lower school well one day in came the doctor to the schoolroom of the fourth i'm in the sixth myself and a personal chum of slade's the head of the school but i happened to have gone to the fourth with a message so i saw what happened a very big man who puffed out his chest like a pigeon followed the doctor he had a blue tie on with a jolly bright diamond in it and there were small purple veins in a regular network over his cheeks and his moustache was yellowish gray and waxed out as sharp as pins a lady followed him with red rims to her little eyes and gold things hanging about her chest the doctor being all arched up and rolled round from the small of the back like a wood louse seemed to show they were parents of perhaps more fellows than one the big chap wore an eyeglass and spoke very loud and was jolly pleasant ah he said and this is where the little boys work eh? i expect now my youngster will be drafted in among these small men dr dunstan it is very possible nay probable in the highest degree my lord said the doctor we are now he continued in the presence of the fourth and lower fourth the classroom is spacious as you see and new a commanding panorama of the surrounding country and our playing fields may be enjoyed from the french windows if two of you lads will move that blackboard from there lord golightly may well be able to see something of the prospect two of the kids promptly knocked down the blackboard nearly on to the purple-veined lord's head then suddenly the lady called out and attracted his attention looking round we found she had got awfully excited and stood pointing straight at young tomlin he was a mere kid at the extreme bottom of the lower fourth but he happened to be my fag so i was interested she pointed at him in the most frantic way with a hand in a browny yellow glove and a gold bracelet outside the glove and a little watch let into the bracelet good gracious she said do look ralph what an astounding resemblance whoever is that boy tomlin turned rather red in the gills which was natural do you know the lad asked the doctor never saw him before in my life but i hope he'll forgive me for being so rude as to point at him in that way she said he's exactly like our dear carlo they might be twins tomlin thought she meant a pet dog and got rather rum to look at carlo is our son you know explained the lord singular coincidence answered dr dunstan not looking very keen about it in fact he wasn't too fond of tomlin at any time and seemed sorry he should be dragged in now but the kid was a very tidy sort really captain of the third footer eleven and a good runner he happened to be the son of a big london hatter who had a shop of enormous dimensions in bond street and the doctor was said to get his own hats there yet he didn't like tomlin tomlin went out into the open and the purple-veined lord shook hands with him and the lord's wife stood him in the light and turned him round to catch different expressions then they admitted that the likeness was really most wonderful and they both hoped tomlin and carlo would be great friends tomlin told by the doctor to answer stood on one leg twisted his arms in a curious way he's got when nervous and said he hoped they might be but he said it as though he knew jolly well they wouldn't then the lord and the lady cleared out and a week later carlo came his real name was westonley and he was a viscount or something being eldest son of an earl but we called him carlo and he grew jolly waxy when he found his nickname had got to merivale before him he fancied himself to a most hideous extent for a kid of nine and explained he'd only come for a year or so before going to eton he went into the lower fourth so tomlin ceased to be at the bottom of that class the likeness between carlo and my fag was really most peculiar it must have been for carlo's own mother to see it but when carlo heard that tomlin would be a hatter in the course of years he refused to have anything to do with him and tomlin loathed carlo too from the start so instead of being chums according to the wish of the purple-veined lord they hated one another and the first licking of any importance which carlo got he had from tomlin 
the chap was a failure all around and it's no good saying he wasn't everybody saw it but dr dunstan and he wouldn't carlo proved to be a sneak and a liar of the deepest sort not to masters but to the chaps and he was also jolly cruel to animals and very much liked to torture things that couldn't hit him back such as mice and insects he had a square face and snubby nose and a voice and eyes exactly similar to tomlin's but there was no likeness in their characters tomlin being a very decent kid as i have said fellows barred carlo all round and he only had one real chum in the miserable shape of fowl fowl sucked up to him and listened for hours about his ancestors and buttered him at all times hoping of course that some day he would get asked to carlo father's castle in the holidays i may also note carlo never played games excepting tossing behind the gymnasium for half pennies with fowl and steggles steggles of course winning happening one day to go down through the playground young tomlin saw westonley near a little fir tree which grew at the top of the drill ground he was alone and seemed to be doing something queer so tomlin stopped and went over what are you up to he said frying ants said carlo though it's no business of yours you see there's turpentine juice come out of this tree where i cut it yesterday and you can stick the ants in it then fry em to a cinder with a burning glass like this that's what you're doing it is don't you think you're rather a little beast what do you mean hatter i mean i'm going to kick you for being such a cruel beast they stood the same height to an inch and were the same age so it was a perfectly sportsmanlike thing for tomlin to offer you seem to forget who you're talking to said carlo no i don't no chance of that your ancestors came over with william the conqueror carried his portmanteau i expect then cleared out when the fighting came on yes and another ancestor stabbed a friend of wat tyler's when he was face down on the ground after somebody else had knocked him over that's what you are aunt fryer i'll thank you to let me pass said carlo i'm not accustomed to talking to people like you and if you think i'm going to fight with a future hatter you're wrong then you can put your tail between your legs and swallow this said tomlin and he went on and licked carlo pretty well he also broke his burning glass you'll live to be sorry for this all your life yelled out carlo when tomlin let him get up off some broken flower pots on the drill ground i'll never forget it i'll get my father to make old dunstan expel you and when i'm a man i'll devote all my time to wrecking your vile hat business and ruining you and making you a shivering starving beggar in the streets go and sneak i should said tomlin and blessed if carlo didn't he tore straight off to the doctor just as he was in his licked condition that much i heard from my fag young tomlin but the rest i saw for myself as the six happened to be before the doctor in his study when carlo arrived he was white and muddy and slightly bloody and panting he looked jolly wicked and his collar had carried away from the stud and his trousers were torn behind my good lad whatever has happened began the doctor don't say you've met with an accident and yet your appearance nothing of the sort said carlo who soon found out the doctor had a weak place for him owing to his being a lord's son i've been frightfully and cruelly mangled through no fault of my own and i believe some things inside me are broken too sit down sit down my unfortunate lad said the doctor then he rang the bell and told the butler to bring viscount westonley a glass of wine at once it's tomlin's done it said carlo he came up behind me and before i could defend myself he trampled on me and tried to tear me limb from limb i'm not strong and i may die of it anyway he ought to be expelled and i'll write to my father the earl about it and he'll make the whole countryside resound if tomlin isn't sent away and his character ruined hush westonley said the doctor have no fear that justice will not be done my boy you shall yourself accuse tomlin and hear what he may have to say in defence then tomlin was sent for and in about ten minutes came is this true boy tomlin said the doctor putting on his big manner one glance at your victim he continued furnishes a more conclusive reply to my question than could any word of yours nevertheless i desire to hear from your own lips whether viscount westonley's assertions are true or not don't know what he's asserted sir said tomlin which was a smart thing for a kid to say 
if he said i've licked him it's true sir that is what he did assert sir in words chosen with greater regard for my feelings than your own and are you aware george tomlin that you have licked one who in the ordinary course of nature and subject to the will of an all-just all-seeing providence will some day take his seat in the house of lords i've heard him say he will sir answered tomlin as though no statement of carlo could be worth believing don't answer in that offensive tone boy answered the doctor his voice rising to the pitch that always went before a flogging if your stagnant sense of right cannot bring a blush to your cheek before the spectacle of your scandalous achievement it will be necessary for me for me your headmaster sir to quicken the blood in your veins and bring a blush to the baser extremity of your person some learn through the head george tomlin some can only be approached through the hide and with the latter category you have long unhappily chosen to throw in your lot tomlin said nothing but looked at carlo before proceeding according to my custom i shall hear both sides of this question audi alteram partem george tomlin now say what you have to say explain why your lamentable your unholy your aboriginal passions led you to fall upon viscount westonleigh from behind to take him in the rear sir after the unmanly fashion of the north american indian or other primitive savage i didn't take him in the rear at all sir said tomlin i stood right up to him and he said he wouldn't fight a future hatter a very proper decision too sir a natural and wise decision declared the doctor why should the son of lord golightly imbue his hand in the blood of well, i will not say a future hatter for i yield to no man in my respect for your father tomlin and his business is alike honourable and necessary but why should he fight anybody if he's challenged he's got to sir or else take a licking no flippancy sir thundered the doctor again who are you to announce the laws which govern the society of merivale shall it be possible in a christian land at a christian college for christian lads to find infamous boys with tigrine instincts parading the fold for the purpose of smiting when and where they will this sir is the very apotheosis of savagery i didn't do it for nothing sir said tomlin i'm not going to sneak of course but i i licked carlo for a jolly good reason and he knows what don't know anything of the sort declared carlo you flew at me like a wolf from behind that's a good one answered tomlin anybody can see you did from the state i'm in said carlo you two boys began the doctor again though you know it not stand here before me as types of a great social movement i may even say upheaval in the democratic age upon which we are now entering we shall find the tomlins at war with the westonleys we shall find the westonleys disdaining to fight and the tomlins accordingly doing what pleases them in their own brutal way now here i find myself met with statement and counterstatement the indictment is all too clear against you boy tomlin for even the glass of old brown sherry which he has just consumed fails to soothe your unfortunate victim's nerve centres he is still far from calm his ganglions are yet vibrating this work of destruction was yours you do not deny it but you refuse any explanation making instead a vague and ambiguous reference to not sneaking no man hates the tale-bearer more than your headmaster sir but there are occasions when the school's welfare and the protection of our little commonwealth make it absolutely necessary that offences should be reported to the ruler of that commonwealth i have no hesitation in saying that westonley saw the present incident in this light he had no right to hush up the matter whatever his private instincts towards mercy his duty to his companions and to me together with a hereditary sense of justice and the fearless instincts of his race compelled him to come before me and report the presence of a young garreter in our midst i select the word george tomlin and i say that having regard to the perverted not to say inverted sense of justice and honour all too common among every community of boys westonleigh's act was a brave act i accept his statement in its entirety consequently tomlin you may join me this evening at nine o'clock after prayers that meant a flogging and tomlin said yes sir and hooked it but the wretched carlo thought he was going to hear tomlin expelled 
he burst out and said as much and the doctor started as if a serpent had stung him and told carlo to control the instinct of revenge so common to all human nature and explained that chaps were not expelled for trifles he reminded carlo that tomlin had an immortal soul like himself and seemed to imply that being expelled from merivale would ruin a chap's future in the next world as well as this one finally he allowed carlo in consideration of the dressing he had got to stop in the playground that afternoon with a book so the little skunk crept off shattered ganglions and all pretending to walk lame while the doctor evidently much bothered altogether took up our work where he had left it tomlin got flogged all right and there the matter ended excepting that a lot of fellows sent carlo to coventry and called him ant friar from that day then within three weeks came the doctor's howler steggles being responsible steggles is a bit of a hound but his cunning is wonderful as for the doctor he continued making much of carlo and sitting on tomlin till one day going into chapel he unexpectedly patted tomlin on the head tomlin was rather pleased because he thought the doctor was relenting to him but when steggles heard of it he said why you fool he thought he was patting weston lee then on an evening when tomlin was cooking a sausage for me in the sixth classroom he said please i should like to speak to you if i may so i chucked work and told him to say what he liked it's only to show how things go against a chap no matter what he does said the kid this term i have been flogged for licking carlo and caned three times since for other things which were more bad luck than anything else and now i'll be flogged again to-morrow for absolute certain why well it's a jolly muddle you know steggles yes you're a fool to go about with him i said perhaps i was anyway steggles and me made a plot to get some of the medlars from the tree on the lawn and we minced out after dark to do it they're simply allowed to fall and rot on the ground which is a waste of good tuck steggles says we went out about ten o'clock last night past brown's study window and we looked in from the shrubbery to see the window open and soda water and whiskey and pipes on the table but no brown strange to say then we sneaked on and steggle suddenly heard something and got funky but i kept him going we reached the tree and steggles lighted his bull's-eye lantern so as to collect the medlars when suddenly out from behind the tree itself rushed a man we hooked it like lightning naturally and i never saw steggles go at such a pace in my life and he stuck to his lantern too but i tripped and fell and before i could get up the man had collared me if you'll believe it the man was brown he asked me who the other chap was and i said i couldn't be quite sure so he told me to go back to bed which i did that was last night and the one medlar we had time to get steggles had eaten before i got back which shows you what steggles is to-day brown will tell the doctor he always chooses the evening after prayers so that he can work the doctor up with his stories and get a chap flogged right away because it often happens when dr dunston says he'll flog a chap next day he doesn't do it and what is steggles going to do he says he is watching events he also says that brown was certainly stealing the doctor's medlars himself and really we surprised him not he us but of course steggles says it's no good my telling the doctor that steggles also says that he's got an idea which may come to something i don't know but he's a very cute chap i've got to keep out of the way after prayers to-night and steggles is going to watch brown he won't tell me his plan i thought once that perhaps he meant giving himself up for me and i asked him and he said i ought to know him better tomlin then cleared out and as the doctor took slade and me for a short greek lesson every evening after prayers because of special examinations i had the good luck to see the end of the business that very night we just got to work by the doctor's green-shaded reading lamp when brown came in with his groveling way pretending he was awfully sorry for having to round on tomlin but that his duty gave him no option and so on last night he said i was sitting correcting exercises in my study when i fancied i saw a form steal across the grass outside thinking some vagabond might be in the grounds i dashed out and followed as quickly as possible presently i saw a light and noted two figures under the medlar tree 
fearing they might be plotting against the house i went straight at them and to my astonishment saw that they were only boys one darted away and i failed to catch him the other i much regret to say was tomlin that is how brown put the affair tomlin again exclaimed the doctor positively that boy's behaviour passes the bounds of endurance yes taking the medlars of one who has always treated him as you have i couldn't trust myself to speak to him he's a very disappointing boy he's a disgraceful degenerate disreputable boy i can forgive much but the stealing of fruit and that my fruit greediness immorality ingratitude in the person of an outrageous lad i thank you brown yours was a zealous act and argued courage of high order oblige me by sending tomlin hither at once there shall be no delay brown hurried off to find the wretched tomlin and dr dunston who always had to work up his feelings before flogging a chap snorted like a horse and took off his glasses and went to the corner behind the bookcase where canes and things were kept he seemed to forget slade and me so we sat tied in the gloom outside the radius of light thrown by the green-shaded lamp and waited with regret to see tomlin catch it the doctor talked to himself as he brought out a birch and swished it through the air once or twice pon my soul he said lord golightly's son was right his knowledge of character is remarkable in so young a lad tomlin will have to be expelled tomlin must go such consistent such inherent depravity appears ineradicable pruning is of no avail the branch must be sacrificed my medlars under cover of darkness and i would have given them freely had he but asked he evidently wasn't going to expel tomlin this time but he meant doing all he knew with the birch and as tomlin was some while coming the doctor's safety valves were regularly humming before he turned up when he did come he walked boldly in and the doctor who had been striding up and down like a lion at the zoo didn't wait for any remarks but just went straight for him seized him by the nape of the neck nipped his hand round his back in a way he did very neatly from long practice and began to administer about the hottest flogging he'd given to any boy in his life so you add the eighth commandment to the others you have already shattered deplorable boy roared the doctor giving tomlin one between each smack you would purloin steal rob the medlars of your preceptor you would lead others to share your sin you would bring tears of grief to a good mother's eyes here the doctor stopped a moment for breath but he still held on to tomlin who much to my surprise wriggled about a good deal in fact he shot out his legs over and over again at intervals like a grasshopper does when it gets into the water and when he got a chance he yelled back at the doctor it's a lie a filthy lie he shrieked out beast devil let me go let me go i never touched your rotten old medlars oh oh then the doctor went off again silence miserable child cease your blasphemies falsehood will not save you now i never touch them i tell you you muddle-headed old beast you're killing me and my father'll imprison you for life for it i wish they would hang you i'll make you smart for this if you only live till i grow up devil but the doctor had shot his bolt he gave tomlin a final smack then shook him off like a spider picked up his mortar-board which had fallen off in the struggle and put the birch in its place now go and don't speak another word or i shall expel you wretched lad meantime slade and i were fairly on the gasp for from the time that tomlin as we thought had called the doctor a devil we realized the truth now his passion nearly choked him he danced with pain and rage only when the doctor took a stride towards him he opened the door and hooked it the doctor puffed up and grunted like a traction ended trying to get up a hill these are the black days in a headmaster's life slade he said that misguided lad thinks that i enjoyed administering his punishment yet both mentally and physically the operation caused me far greater suffering than it brought to him i am wounded wounded to the heart and the exertion causes and will cause me much discomfort for hours to come owing to its unusual severity 
i may say that not for ten years has it been necessary for me to flog a boy as i have just flogged george tomlin now let us proceed i couldn't have broken it to him but slade did he said please sir it wasn't tomlin not tomlin not tomlin what do you mean boy who was it then said the doctor his eyebrows going up to his forehead which was all quite dewy from the hard work it was young carlo i mean westonley said slade viscount westonley gasped the doctor his mouth dropping right open in a very rum way by itself if you understand me yes sir then why in the name of heaven didn't you say so how dare you stand there and watch me commit an offence against law and justice how did you dare to watch me ignorantly torture an innocent boy and that boy go both of you you slade and you butler also go instantly and send brown and viscount westonley to me good god this is terrible terrible so that was his howler and to see him in his chair looking so old and haggard and queer was rather frightful he seemed suddenly struck with limpness and his hands shook like anything and so did his bald head and he puffed as if he'd been running miles and slade said afterwards that he looked jolly frightened too he put his face in his hands as we went out and we heard him say something about lord golightly and ruin and universal opprobrium on his grey hairs though really he had none worth mentioning and slade said he almost thought the doctor was actually going to cry if such a thing could be possible we sent brown off to him but carlo wasn't to be found he'd been yelling somewhere but couldn't be traced what had happened was this tomlin in obedience to steggles had kept rather close after prayers in fact he had spent the half hour to bedtime in a cupboard in the gymnasium under the rubber shoes so brown not finding him had told the first boy he saw to do so and that boy happened to be steggles who had been at his heels ever since he went to the doctor steggles is a miserable unwholesome thing but his strategy certainly comes off once having the message all was easy because steggles merely found carlo and told him the doctor wanted him the result was much better than even steggles hoped because though the doctor generally fell on a chap who came to be flogged straight away like he did on carlo it wasn't often anybody got such a frightful strong dose as carlo had afterwards when taxed steggles swore of course that he thought he was talking to tomlin seeing the likeness this might have been perfectly true though in their secret hearts everybody knew steggles too jolly well to really believe it carlo didn't turn up and after an hour or more of frantic rushing about somebody said perhaps he'd jumped down the garden well owing to the indignity of what he'd got but soon afterwards in reply to a special telegram sent for the doctor by the people at the railway station an answer came from golightly towers twenty miles off where the purple-veined lord father of carlo hung out the kid it seemed had sloped down to merivale railway station after his licking and taken a ticket right away for golightly and gone home by the last train but one that night he never returned either but next day his father dropped in on dr dunstan and fowl managed to hear a little of what went on through the keyhole he said that as far as he could make out the lord didn't think much of the matter and said one thrashing more or less wouldn't mar carlo but the lord's wife who didn't come evidently took the same view as carlo for he never returned to dunstan's again the doctor's howler ended in his losing the little bounder altogether which with his views about lords in general and especially earls might have been frightfully rough on him as to tomlin actually the doctor never flogged him after all i think his spirit had got a bit broken and though tomlin went at the end of the term he wasn't expelled but withdrawn by mutual consent like you hear of things in parliament sometimes he wouldn't have gone at all but he refused to say who was under the medlar tree with him and stuck to it and steggles absolutely declined to give himself up because as he truly said he had more than kept his promise to tomlin about helping him out of the mess so tomlin went 
he was a very decent little chap indeed and nearly all the fellows at dunston's promised faithfully to buy their hats entirely at his place in bond street london when they left school which will be very good business for him if they do as for the doctor it's a peculiar fact that for a whole term after carlo's affair he never flogged a single chap he didn't seem to have any heart in him somehow owing to the rum way the howler told upon his spirit end of story nine story ten of the human boy by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story ten morant's half sob of course as steggles said truly the rummest thing about the whole story of morant's half sob was that he should have one morant in fact never got any pocket money in his life owing to his father being a gentleman farmer not that he had nothing on the contrary his hampers were certainly the best except fowls that ever came to dunston's both for variety and size and fruit the farming business morant said was all right from his point of view in the holidays as the ferreting both rats and rabbits was good enough for anything and three packs of hounds met within walking distance of his farm one pack being harriers which morant by knowing the country well could run with to a certain extent while they hunted but morant's father was so worried about chemical manures and other farming things including the prices of wheat that he didn't see his way to giving morant any pocket money he explained to morant once that he was putting every halfpenny he could spare into morant's education so as to save him from having to become a gentleman farmer too when he grew up but morant didn't get a farthing in a general way so when there arrived a hamper with an envelope in it and in the envelope a bit of paper and in the paper a half sovereign morant was naturally extremely surprised and also pleased it came from his godfather who had never taken any notice of morant for thirteen years though he was a clergyman but the previous term morant had got a prize for scripture history and when that came to his godfather's ears through morant's mother mentioning it in a letter he wrote and said it was good news and very unexpected so he sent the money and really morant was quite bewildered with it being so utterly unaccustomed to tin even in the meanest shape he had a friend by the name of ferrars who was much more religious than morant himself and knew even more scripture history and as a first go-off he asked ferrars what he ought to do with the money and ferrars said that before everything morant ought to give a tithe to charity but when it was explained to morant that this meant chucking away a shilling on the poor he didn't take to the idea an atom he said his father had set him against giving tithes not believing in them very much so morant went to gideon who knew much more about money than ferrars and he said on no account to give a penny away in charity because morant wasn't up in the subject and might do more harm than good he also said that in the case of a chap who had never had a half sovereign in his life before it was a great question whether he could be expected to give away any and morant said there was no question about it at all because he wasn't going to and it made even a difference in his feeling toward ferrars for as he very truly said a chap who advised him like ferrars had couldn't be much of a friend having decided to keep it the point was what to do with it the novelty of the thing staggered him and knowing he would probably never have another half-sovereign till he grew up morant felt the awful importance of spending it right because an affair once bought could never be replaced if lost and as bray said if you get used to a thing like a watch-chain or a tie-ring and then lose it the feeling you get is much worse than if you had never had it at all i thought about it too for morant as he once sent me a brace of rabbits by post shot by himself in the holidays i pointed out to him that half a sovereign was a most difficult sum really being as it were not small and not exactly huge and yet too much to make light of especially in morant's case if he had got a sovereign for instance he might have bought a silver watch-chain to take the place of one which he had it was made of the hair of his grandmother when she was young and morant didn't much like it and had often tried to sell it and failed but ten bob wouldn't buy a silver chain worth having 
morant had an idea about braces and of course he might have bought such braces for the money as would have been seldom seen and very remarkable but braces are a poor thing to put good money into and i dissuaded him there came a change in morant after he had the half-sovereign for four days and not thought of anything to buy he began to worry because time was going on and nothing being done fellows gave him many ideas some of which he took for an hour or two but always abandoned after a while murray told him of a wonderful box of new conjuring tricks which was to be had and he nearly bought it but luckily remembered just in time that the new tricks would get old after a while and some might be guessed and would become useless then parkinson had a remarkably swagger paint-box and knew where morant could get another with only three paints less for ten shillings and morant as near as a toucher bought that but happened to remember he couldn't paint and didn't care in the least about trying to corky minimus said he would run the risk and sell corky minor's bat to morant for ten bob the bat having cost twelve the bat was spliced and corky minor was in australia having luckily for him sailed to sea just before an exam owing to a weak lung if morant had played cricket he would certainly have bought the bat but there again even though gideon told him he might easily get ten and six or eleven shillings for the bat next term he hesitated and finally gideon bought the bat himself as an investment he said well there was morant stuck with his tin he wouldn't even change it because gideon warned him against that and told him his father knew men who had made large fortunes simply by not changing gold when they had it gideon said there was nothing like never changing gold so morant didn't only of course there was no good in keeping the money especially stitched into a private and unknown part of his trousers as he did for safety that half-sovereign acted like a regular cloud on morant's mind and then came an extraordinary day when it acted more like a cloud than ever owing to its disappearing morant had sewn it with a needle and thread borrowed from the housekeeper into a spot at the bottom of his left trouser pocket and from this spot it mysteriously vanished in the space of two hours and a half he had changed in the dormitory for footer and left his trousers on his bed at three o'clock returning to them at four forty five then naturally feeling for his half-sovereign he missed it altogether and when he examined the spot he found his money had been cut out of the bottom of the pocket with a knife very wisely morant seeing what a tremendous thing had happened did not make a lot of row but just told about ten chaps and no more i was one my name is newness i said the first question is who knew your secret hiding-place and butler said it was a very good question and showed sense in me butler is of course high in the sixth morant on thinking it over decided that three chaps or four at the outside knew his hiding-place they were ferrars gideon fowl and morant thought phipps so first butler who very kindly undertook the affair for morant had phipps brought up phipps stammers even when most calm and collected and being sent for by butler caused him so much excitement that butler made him write down the answers to his questions and even then phipps lost his nerve so that he spelled yes with two s's but he solemnly put down and signed that morant had never told him where he kept his half-sovereign and after he had gone morant said that now he came to think about it he felt sure phipps was right which reduced the matter to ferrars gideon and fowl the first two were set aside by morant because ferrars was of course his personal friend despite the passing coldness about ferrars advice and gideon though very keen about money and a great judge of it was known to be absolutely straight and had never so much as choused a kid out of a marble butler said that leaves fowl and if you told fowl you were a little fool and morant said we were both roman catholics by religion and that makes a great tie and though many chaps hate fowl pretty frightfully i've never known him try to score off me except once when he failed and apologized 
and butler said oh, that's all right i dare say but he's a little beast and a cur and also a sneak of the deadliest die i don't say he's taken the money because that's a liable and he might i believe go to law against me but i do say that only one out of three people could have taken it and we know two didn't therefore q e d the other must have morant didn't follow this very clever reasoning on the part of butler he only thought that fowl being a roman catholic would never rob another and butler said he would because it wasn't like freemasons who wouldn't score off one another for the world he explained that history was simply choked up with examples of roman catholics scoring off one another butler said religion's quite different one buddhist is often known to have done another buddhist in the eye so why shouldn't one roman do another in fact they have thousands of times as you'll know when you come to read a little history and hear about the spanish inquisition especially this may have happened seeing that fowl is the chap i tell you candidly that in my opinion after a good deal of experience of fellows in general i take fowl to be the most likely boy in merivale to have done it and knowing him to have had the secret of the private pocket reduces it to a certainty in my mind tax him with it suddenly in the night and you'll see morant slept in the same dormitory with fowl and that night the whole room was woke up at some very late hour by the sound of morant taxing fowl fowl took a long time to realize what was being said and when he was awake enough to realize what morant was getting at he showed tremendous indignation and asked what he had ever done that such a charge should be brought against him especially at such a time he reminded morant that they were of the same way of thinking in holy affairs and said he was extremely sick with morant and thought morant's religion must be pretty rocky if it allowed him to wake a chap up in the middle of the night and charge him with such a crime in fact fowl went on so that morant finally apologized rather humbly from that day forward began the extraordinary disappearance of coin in general at dunstan's shillings constantly went and also half crowns gideon got very excited about it and said watches must be kept and traps set there was evidently a big robbery going on and gideon said if the chaps weren't smart enough to catch the thief they deserved to lose their tin certainly he never lost a penny himself but despite tremendous precautions money kept going in small sums ferrars was set to watch in the pavilion i remember during a football match and morant himself and even butler once or twice also watched some chaps thought it was the ground man but as money also disappeared at school that showed it couldn't be him and then there was a theory that it might be a charwoman who came from maryville twice a week i believe she was a very good charwoman of her kind and ferrars who is great about helping the poor and so on told me she was a very deserving woman with a husband at home who drank and children too numerous to mention which gideon remembered against the charwoman when the money began to go and it turned his suspicion towards her because as he said with the state of her home affairs money must be a great temptation so a watch was set on her and a curious thing happened being small i can get into a boot cupboard very easily and i can also breathe anywhere through a hole bored with a gimlet this was done to the door of the boot cupboard and two other rather larger holes were also made for my eyes mrs gouger which was the charwoman's name had to do a lot of work in this room a large one leading out of the gym and there on a certain half holiday i was watching her she worked jolly hard as far as i could see and made a good deal of dust and a curious noise through her teeth when she scrubbed which i thought only men did when they washed horses but there was nothing suspicious if you understand me she didn't touch a coat or anything though many were hanging against a wall and the few caps about she merely picked up and hung on the pegs then just before she finished who should come in but ferrars and to my great astonishment mrs gouger curtsied to him as though he had been the housekeeper or the doctor ferrars treated her with great loftiness and evidently knew all about her private affairs he said 
and how is the child that's got mumps and she said it was better he then gave her some advice about her husband which i didn't hear and she blessed him for all his goodness to her and said god had sent him to a lone struggling woman and that he would reap a thousandfold what he had sown all of which coming from mrs gouger to ferrars seemed very curious to me presently he said well i cannot stop longer i'm glad the child is better keep on at your husband about the pledges and here's a shilling then mrs gouger put the shilling in her pocket and blessed him again and ferrars went that very day young forrest lost a shilling out of his desk which doesn't lock owing to forrest having taken the lock off to sell to meadows last term i told butler and gideon what i had seen and butler thought it rum and gideon said there was more in it than met the eye butler said evidently the kid ferrars is a kid from butler's point of view has given the charwoman tin before or else she wouldn't have blessed him now the question is how much pocket money does ferrars get and i said a shilling a week when does he get it mondays butler said ah but nothing seemed to strike him and gideon thought that mrs gouger ought to be spoken to this gideon undertook to do and the next week he did what happened was that mrs gouger said all that she had before said to ferrars about her husband and children but added that a young gentleman with a most christian heart had lately interested himself in her misfortunes gideon asked if it was a dunstan chap and mrs gouger answered that she was not at liberty to say she seemed rather defiant about it gideon thought and in fact when he pressed her for the amount the chap gave her she told gideon to mind his own business a watch was still kept especially on ferrars and once butler did an awfully cunning thing by setting ferrars to watch and setting another chap to watch ferrars if you follow what i mean the other chap was butler himself and the room was a dormitory but it came out rather awkwardly for butler because he sneezed at the very start and ferrars got out from under the bed where he had arranged to watch and found butler watching behind a coat against the wall then they had a row because ferrars evidently thought butler was there to watch him which he was the end of the affair came out rather tame in its way and only shows what awfully peculiar ideas some chaps have gideon finally spoke to slade the head of the school and though slade doesn't like gideon owing to his way of making money by usury yet it was such a serious affair that he listened all through and promised to go to the doctor gideon had actually kept an account of all the money stolen and it amounted now to the tremendous sum of four pounds five shillings and sixpence including morant's half-sovereign then after mr dunstan knew we heard one day from fowl that he had sent for mrs gouger to his study and that she had been there fully half an hour and come out crying fowl had listened as best he could till the doctor's butler had come by and told him to hook it but he had heard nothing except one remark in the voice of mrs gouger and that remark was four pound five and sixpence sir and a godsend if ever money was gideon said her mentioning of the exact sum was a very ominous thing for ferrars and what was more ominous still happened that evening for ferrars wasn't at prep or prayers there were a number of ideas about as to what it all meant and corky minimus who always tries to get among chaps bigger than himself and say clever things came out with a theory that mrs gouger was ferrars's mother and that ferrars was therefore stealing and making the money over to her but butler merely smacked his head when he heard it and told corky minimus not to be a little ass gideon was the only chap who hadn't any idea he knew ferrars's great notions about helping the poor and giving tithes to parsons and so on but he said for a chap to steal money and hand it over to a charwoman in charity was contrary to human nature all the same if a thing actually happens it can't be contrary to human nature anyway after prayers next morning the doctor stopped the school and chapel and explained everything 
he said my boys while it is true that you come to merivale to be instructed by me and those who labor here among you on my behalf it is also true that i learn occasionally from those whom i teach indeed new problems are almost as often set by you for my solution as by me for yours and seldom has a more intricate difficulty confronted me than that which yesterday challenged my attention there has recently happened among us a mysterious disappearance of coins of the realm now a shilling a sixpence a penny piece if deposited in one spot will usually remain there until removed by human agency and the human agent who removes money which belongs to another without that other's sanction is a thief boys briefly there has been a thief among you a thief whose moral obliquity has taken such an extraordinary turn whose views of rectitude have become so distorted that even my own experience of schoolboy ethics cannot parallel his performance this lad has looked around him upon the world and found in it as we all must find a vast amount of suffering and privation of honest toil and of humble heroism displayed by the lowest among us he has also observed that providence is pleased to make wide distinctions between the rich and the poor he has noted that where one labors for daily bread another reaps golden harvests without the trouble of putting in the sickle this extraordinary boy contrasted the position of one of these humble workers with that of those among whom his own lot was thrown here and he found that whereas that obscure but necessary and excellent person mrs gouger she whose duty it is to cleanse scour and otherwise purify the disorder produced by our assemblies he found i say that whereas mrs gouger worked extremely hard for sums not considerable albeit handsome in connection with the nature of her labours others of the human family yourselves were in receipt of weekly allowances of varying amounts for which you toiled not neither did you spend this unhappy lad allowed his mind to brood on the apparent injustice of such an arrangement and instead of coming to his headmaster for an explanation of this and other problems which arose to puzzle his immature intelligence permitted himself the immoral the scandalous the disgraceful and horribly mistaken course of writing the balance from his point of view this could only be effected by defiance of those divine laws which govern all properly constituted bodies of human society ferrars i need not conceal his name any longer ferrars broke one commandment in order to obey another his fatuous argument as it was elaborated yesterday to me stands based on error his crime was the result of the most complicated ignorance and vicious sophism it has ever been my lot to discover in a boy of twelve he did evil that good might come ascertaining from the inspired word that charity covereth a multitude of sins he imagined it must extend to cover that forbidden by the eighth commandment this commandment he broke no less than fourteen times you ask with horror why that the domestic affairs of mrs gouger might be ameliorated he took the pocket-money of his colleagues and with it modified those straits into which poverty and conjugal difficulties have long cast mrs gouger it was ferrars's unhappy and i may say unparalleled design to go on appropriating the money of his schoolmates until a sum of five pounds had been raised and conveyed to mrs gouger of this total with deplorable ingenuity he had already subtracted from various pockets the sum of four pounds five shillings and sixpence it was his intention to continue these depredations until the entire sum had been collected but the end has come the facts have been placed before me and i confess to you that perhaps never have i been confronted with a problem more peculiar after a lengthy conversation with those who support me here and after placing the proposition before a higher tribunal than any which earth has to offer i have come to a curious decision i have determined to leave the fate of the boy ferrars in your hands this time to-morrow i shall expect slade as representing the school to inform me of your decision and to-day contrary to custom will be a half-holiday that the school may debate the question and conclude upon it 
i would point out that there is no middle course here in my opinion either ferrars must be forgiven after a public apology to the establishment he has outraged or he must be expelled as for the money if those who have lost it will apply to me between one and two o'clock to-day each will have his share again well you may guess what a jaw there was that afternoon and finally after hours of talk slade decided the point must be arranged by putting papers into a hat if you drew a cross on the paper it meant that you wanted ferrars to be expelled and if you drew a knot that meant he was to be let off you were not bound to say how you voted and the excitement when the votes were counted was something frightful ferrars little knew what was going on at last the numbers were read out for expulsion one hundred and twenty four against expulsion one hundred and one and slade and bradwell were mad when slade read them and said that merivale was disgraced but gideon and butler and ashby major and trelawney said not and thought it wasn't a case for anything but justice the doctor made no remark when he heard what had happened but i heard him tell the new master thompson a day afterwards that perhaps the lower school ought not to have been allowed to vote as small boys would merely have understood that ferrars had stolen money and nothing else their minds the doctor said were not big enough to take in the peculiar nature of the case but thompson said he honestly believed the school was perfectly right and that the subtleties of the case were not for that court and the doctor sighed and said it might be so anyway ferrars went we never saw him again and the only cheerful thing about the end of it was that steggles was badly scored off you see he nipped off to the doctor among the first and said ferrars had stolen ten shillings from him too but it happened that ferrars had kept the most careful account of all the money he had raised for mrs gouger and the people he had raised it from but he had never taken a farthing from steggles so steggles was flogged by mannering in his best form which shows that things which are frightfully sad in themselves often produce fine results in a roundabout sort of manner End of story ten story eleven of the human boy by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story eleven the buccaneers of course even a kid can get a good idea sometimes and maine who i was fagging for said afterwards that the idea was all right whether young bailey or me thought of it first i don't know but maine lent me a book about corsairs and buccaneers and such like people and he said it was a great life though not much followed in present times he was no good for a corsair himself because the sea always made him dreadfully bad and besides he was going to be a bush ranger some day being an australian and well up on it but he said that drake and raleigh and many other men in our english history were buccaneers of the deadliest sort and had made england what it was so me and bailey thought a lot about it and wished a good deal we could begin that sort of life bailey said that in all the books he'd read if a boy began young he was generally a supercargo and went on getting greater and greater slowly but i thought boys began as cabin boys and got greater very quickly by rescuing people but bailey said that was only in books and that nobody got on quickly at sea owing to the competition he did not much think there were any buccaneers left but maine said there were chiefly off the coast of africa and that daring and deadly deeds were done in the mediterranean to this day he said the lawlessness there was awful and that nobody knew what went on along the north side of africa in little bays and inlets there not marked on maps when bailey heard that he took more interest in it and wished he had been born the son of a pirate instead of a doctor because he said he should have come easily to it if our fathers had been in that course of life but when i told maine he said that the best and most splendid pirates had had to overcome great difficulties in their youth and that it was the pirate who began as a mere boy at school who often made the greatest name 
bailey said he was a pirate at heart and i said i was too but not until we read a beautiful book by stevenson could we see any way to be one really then we saw that we must go away from merivale in secret in fact we must fly and bailey said it would have to be by night to avoid capture and maine said it was so but it was a tremendous thing to do and i asked bailey about his mother and bailey said his mother would blub a good deal at first but she would live to be proud of him when his name was ringing through england and i felt the same in a way because though i have got no mother to blub i have got an uncle who is my guardian and he is a lawyer and a conservative who has tried to get into parliament and failed then me and bailey talked it out when chaps were asleep in our dormitory and the thing was what we should really and truly be because there were corsairs and buccaneers and pirates and they all had their own peculiar ways so we asked maine which was best and he said buccaneers he didn't seem to know exactly what a corsair was but he told us all about pirates and he said they kill women and children and bailey said he'd rather be a doctor like his father than do that and i said the same but a buccaneer is very different being like raleigh and drake and a buccaneer may have his name ringing through england but a pirate never has being rather a beast really maine said it was like this a pirate always thinks of himself and nobody else but the best sort of buccaneer thinks of himself of course but thinks of his country too and after he has replenished his coffers he makes his sovereign a present of islands and so on which are generally called after him so that his name may never be forgotten and bailey said that was the sort he wanted to be and i said so too we thanked maine a great deal and he said it was a big idea for such kids as us to get and hoped we were made of the right stuff and promised not to say a word to a soul and we finally decided to try it and bailey said we must have a plan for action so we made one he said we must run away and work gradually by night to the coast and go to plymouth and get into the docks and find a ship bound for the north coast of africa i asked him what next and he said very truly that that was enough to begin with and that by the time we had done that much many adventures would have fallen to our lot and we might already be in the way to become buccaneers and i said i hoped we should make friends at sea but he said the fewer friends we made the better buccaneers we should probably be because it is not a life where you can make friends safely in fact no real buccaneer would trust his own brother a yard and i said we must trust one another at any rate and bailey said as far as that went he supposed we must but he said it reluctantly the thing was then to save up for the different weapons maine said we shouldn't want arms and that money was all we should require till we got down south but bailey felt sure we must at least have pistols because in books the man armed to the teeth is never molested if people know but the unarmed man often loses his life for want of a weapon we had one shilling pocket money a week each and bailey getting a birthday very fortunately made a whole pound by it after we had been saving for three weeks so between us we suddenly had one pound six shillings and bailey said it was share and share alike for the present and always would be unless some deadly hatred sprang up between us and i said it never would but he said it might and if it did it would probably be about a girl if books were true and i larfed because we both have a great contempt for all girls well things went all right and on a half holiday we managed to get to merivale and buy pistols they were five shillings and sixpence each and the man didn't seem too much like selling them but we got them and ammunition fifty rounds each and bailey said that would be enough maine said they were very good pistols for close work but advised us never to use them unless in sore straits and we said we wouldn't it was the day of the menagerie at merivale that me and bailey finally took the great step of going we had collected a lot of food and studied geography so as to get to plymouth and we arranged that we should travel by night and hide by day in the heart of impenetrable woods which we did 
after the menagerie at a certain point on the way home we slipped it round a corner and thompson didn't see us and in a brief time we were at the edge of merivale woods free to-night bailey said we will get across this forest and do eight or ten miles along the high road and so reach oakshot woods at dawn they are on the edge of the moor and quite impenetrable so we got well into merivale woods first and made a lair of bracken under a fir tree and we cut off some of the fir tree bark and licked the sap which is very nourishing and feeding because we wanted to save our food as much as possible but we had each a cold sausage and a drink of water and then night came on and i felt for the first time that we had done a tremendous deed we're fairly started i said to bailey it's just call over at merivale now and he said yes if the fellows in the upper third could only see us i said it's a small beginning and he said it is but if things go right and we are made of the proper stuff for buccaneers we'll make england ring yet then it began to rain rather hard and i found that a wood isn't really a dry place by night if it rains and bailey lighted a match and said it was nearly nine that'll mean lights out at merivale he said but for us it'll mean the beginning of the night i sneezed just about then because water from the fir tree was dropping down my neck rather fast and bailey said if i was going to get anything the matter with me i had better go back at once because no buccaneer ever had a cold being men of steel and iron and i said a sneeze was nothing then we started very coarserly through the wood and bailey corked his pistol and i asked him kindly to walk in front feeling a curious sensation when he walked behind me with his pistol cocked i told him and he said it was fear but i said it was caution sometimes he whispered a cave and we sunk down and got frightfully dripping in the wet but nothing happened and we were getting well on through the woods when bailey said cave again and this time when we got sunk down we distinctly heard a footstep and bailey said it was our first adventure and i said i wished it had come by daylight because it wants great practice to face adventures in the dark at first anyway the noise got nearer and got louder and bailey and me both cocked our pistols and he said reserve your fire to close range and i said yes then he said i see the thing it's bigger than a beast you would expect in an english wood and i said i have got a sort of feeling it is something out of the menagerie and he said then it will be a real adventure and i wish we were up trees but it was too late and something went quite close i saw a red spark and bailey said fire which we did at least my pistol went off with fearful effect but bailey's didn't and he said afterwards that he'd made the pistol man bitterly rue the day he sold him a treacherous weapon but after i fired we heard a human voice and it said hell then it said other fearful words which bailey said we ought to remember because they were buccaneering words curiously enough and then the man dashed towards us which showed i had not slain him or even hit him in a vital spot and we fled and soon we found that we had distanced him although we had a squeak for it he was a keeper said bailey and he will think we were poachers and raise a hue and cry we must keep on and get into oakshot woods or we shall very likely have to yield to superior force after this excitement i got a curious feeling in my stomach and telling bailey he said it was either hunger or fear and i said it was hunger but bailey said seeing what a heavy meal we had made with sausage and bread and turpentine juice only two hours before that it was fear i said if he thought so he'd better go on without me as i hadn't taken to this course of life to be cheeked by him and he said he was leader of the gang and i was the gang and the first thing was to learn to obey orders and then i got rather cross with bailey and asked him who he thought he was to give me orders and reminded him my pistol could go off anyway which was more than his could this worried him a good deal because of course the man whose pistol went off had the best of it then he said that it was no good having a quarrel between ourselves while we were not yet out of danger he also said that he believed we might venture to take one hour's sleep to strengthen us before getting on to oakshot and i said yes but thought that one of us ought to watch while the other slept 
bailey said he would watch first and he said also that we might get to the woodman's hut in the middle of merivale woods if we kept on past a dead fir tree with its stem white because all the bark was off which we did because the moon was now shining very brightly and the rain had stopped the cold was also frightful and my teeth chattered once or twice but i broke sticks and things to attract bailey because if he had heard my teeth he would have said it was fear again once a bough jumped back and hit bailey a frightful smack in the face and i was glad and he said he rather thought his eye was done for and he said it didn't much matter if it was so long as he had one good eye to see with because most buccaneers lost an eye sooner or later though generally with a stroke from a cutlass we found the hut and there was some dry fern in it and we lighted a candle end we had and took off our boots and wrung out our socks and each had half a current dumpling then bailey looked at his watch and said i might turn in for half an hour then he would wake me and turn in for half an hour himself he went on guard with another candle end and advised me to draw my pistol and sleep with it cocked under my head but i said i never heard of such a dangerous thing as that being done and kept my pistol ready cocked near my hand i didn't fall off to sleep as i expected owing to anxiety as to our fate but i shut my eyes and thought a great deal and after my eyes had been shut some time i opened one a little and was greatly surprised to see bailey coming towards me stealthily he had his pistol in his hand and first i had a horrible thought he wanted to kill me so that he might have all our food and money and then i felt sure he was coming to change pistols so that he might have the one that went off this made me get in a frightful wax with him because i saw he was very unreliable and not really as much of a chum as i had thought so i waited until i saw him stretch out his hand for my pistol and then i leapt at his throat in a very ferocious way that much surprised him i also said hell like the keeper had it must have been a solemn sight by the light of the candle end when we began to fight tooth and nail for the pistol which could go off we were both desperate and it was really a battle to decide which should be the leader of the enterprise and which should be merely the gang then while we wrestled and strained every nerve a curious thing happened for we fell against the candle end stuck on the top of a stick and the candle end fell against the side of the hut and the hut being made of wood with walls of dried heather was very inflammable and caught fire almost immediately and then bailey said we must agree to settle our dispute later on and fly at once so we each took our own pistol and were just going to leave the scene when to our great horror we heard voices and among them the voices of brown and manwaring who were of course housemasters at merivale exhausted though we were me and bailey made a terrible effort to escape and i think we might have done so even then but owing to the moon and two other men who were with merrymwaring we could not reach an impenetrable part of the wood and finally mainwaring court me and a man court bailey and they dragged us into the light of the blazing ruins of the hut and we found out that brown and mainwaring had come after us like beastly bloodhounds and had met the keeper who told them he had been fired upon and then the unfortunate burning of the hut had directed their steps towards us and it's a solemn lesson in a way showing what risk it is for buccaneers to fall out among themselves at critical moments of course we had to walk back merely as prisoners of mainwaring but bailey told me not to answer questions and rather let them cut our tongues out than know the truth so they didn't get anything out of us and when we got back at two o'clock in the morning dunston was up to meet us and by that time what with cold and bruises and the failure of the scheme i wasn't equal to defying dunston and merely said we wanted to change our course of life for something different and had started to do so and i also said that burning the hut was an accident which might have happened to anybody and bailey said the same then dr dunston sent for the matron and we had brandy and water and a hot bath which was very refreshing to me but bailey said bitterly when he was in it that he had thought that morning never to have had a bath again 
he also said we should be put in separate bedrooms that night and that if either of us got an opportunity to escape it was his duty to rescue the other but i said i didn't want to escape being frightfully sleepy and exhausted and i said that if he escaped he needn't trouble to rescue me because if i returned again to being a buccaneer it certainly wouldn't be with him i didn't see any more of him until next day then we were taken in like prisoners of war before the school and dr dunstan lectured upon us as if we were beasts of prey and he said that a course of faulty literature was to blame for our running away and said that the school library must be reformed but he never knew the great truth because he said we were only running away to sea because of the fascination of the ocean to the british character when really it was to be buccaneers and the terror of the mediterranean maine showed us all the points we had done wrong afterwards and he said the way we had fought for the best pistol was very interesting to him and a great warning not to trust in your fellow-creatures and after he had lectured upon us dr dunstan flogged me and bailey in public which showed the stuff we were made of because though bailey gets very red when flogged he has never been known to shed a tear and i get very white curiously enough but i have never been known to shed a tear either end of story eleven end of the human boy by eden philpotts